the band <laughs> pastors are back. That's true. We did take some time off. And now we know why. <laughs> I guess the re-education camp didn't take. But um, no, then that's why I like that. Because then when I, I, I teach, instead of teaching like a small, like it's a little seminary class, instead for me and for you, it's more rabbinical where we're getting into the grammar and we're asking like when he uses these terms or he talks this way in the first chapter of Habakkuk, where because mm-hmm. you read Amos, here's the burden of the Lord that came to Amos. And then right. Amos just goes and preaches. Or Zephaniah, who was already a prophet, and he just goes and preaches. Whereas Habakkuk's like, yeah, I don't think so. No, you're going to say this. I don't think I am. <laughs> well, yeah. why aren't you going to say this? Because uh, I've been paying attention, and uh, I don't think you're paying attention. And God's like, on that note, um, check the horizon. I'm like, yeah, there's an army. Yeah, I'm with them. And you're like, <laughs> um, okay. And then you get into chapter two where he's like, yeah, I'm going to go up in a turret on a tower, and I'm going to wait to see if you're true to your word or not, because... Because Habakkuk accuses God in chapter one of, of the text of creating evil. He's right. like, he's like, you wouldn't really, so this is the best part, cause, and this is the beauty of Peterson's translation is, God says, I'm with the Babylonians, I've raised them up, they're, mm-hmm. they're, they worship their strength like a god, they're like a fisherman who catches his fish and then puts his rod and reel on the altar and worships the rod and reel. And then, ha- and he's like, and I've sent them to kill you, Right. And then Habakkuk responds with, what you mean, Lord, is you're going to send them to discipline us for our, <laughs> our hard-heartedness. Yeah, yeah. And it's, it's almost like Abraham. To soften the blow a little bit. Yeah, it's bit. like, well, you don't mean kill-kill, right? You mean like, like run us over, but not kill-kill. He's like, Kinda no, like I'm going to... Aaron, Aaron with the golden calf, right? I'm going to reduce, your, I'm gonna reduce your city to dust. <laughs> and then you get in chapter two, and he's like, you're a liar. And you're like, this is the most honest depiction of the call that mm-hmm. you could possibly find in Scripture. It's way better than even Peter, who's like, oh, we left everything for you. And Jesus is like, ah, I'll give you 10 more of everything that you lost. Whereas God right. to Habakkuk's like, oh, no, I'm absolutely going to kill you. No, absolutely. And but it's to, not evil. But to your point with the message, I mean, I had this yesterday. We were doing the, um, you know, uh, John, no, Luke 24, right? They weren't believing for joy, disbelieving right. for joy. And, right. and, they, and they're like, what does that even mean? I'm like, it's too good to be true. Oh, Okay, now we get it. <laughs> there we go. See, that's what I mean. Yeah. Because it's, it's just easier for me as an exegete to say, okay, I've already translated this. I've read this for 30 years. And what I do then is, familiarity breeds contempt, I'll read text like Genesis 1 and just fly through it because I've translated it from Hebrew and Greek and Latin. Yeah, and yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, taught yeah. it forever. But then when you read the message and you read it, you're like, hmm, that's an interesting translation choice. And then it's I, not, I mean, it's not head. a translation. I mean, that's fine. We can argue it's about paraphrase, that. It's whatever you want to say. It. It, it's a paraphrase, but it but has for the purpose of meaning. Yes. Right? Exactly. To say, and so you can say, okay, there's a he- Hebrew idiom here. We could yeah. translate it literally. Yeah. That would be a translation. Or you right. could say, what is, what is that idiom getting at? Do we have, at? Yeah, and do we have something yeah. equivalent to that? And I, think... I, I liken it to like uh, reading the Bible for preaching. That's, yeah, that seems exactly. to me that's what I was going to say is, is that for the purposes of preaching and teaching, I prefer a paraphrastic translation next alongside of the original text. What but was if the one I'm that the people be... liked a lot? The the Living Translation? New Living Translation or something? The Nearly Inspired Version? Yeah, that one. Yeah. No, not the NIV. No, the Living Bible. It was called the yeah, Living Bible. Yeah, it was Bible. the Living Bible. Yep. Yeah, it was the same. It wasn't quite as dramatic as the message as far as no. it's paraphrasing, but, but right. it did. Well, and that's it, why I don't like it, because I had that. That was one of the first Bibles I ever bought was the Living Translation of the New oh, Testament. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. And I just find it too soft. The language was way too soft. Whereas Peterson in the Old Testament, the New oh yeah, Testament no, he doesn't care of, about soft language. No, no he's like, no, let's get to the point. So let me just read this real quick. Then this is from the Message, Chapter One of Habakkuk, and just this is so euphonic and and poetic versus the kind of stilted wooden translation of the ESV. This is the problem: is God gave Habakkuk to see it. God, how long do I have to cry out for help before you listen? How many times do I have to yell, help, murder, police, before you come to the rescue? <laughs> Why do you force me to look at evil and stare at trouble in the face day after day? Anarchy and violence break out, quarrels and fights all over the place. Law and order fall to pieces. Justice is a joke. The wicked have the righteous hamstrung and stand justice on its head. And then God says, look around at the godless nations. Look long and hard and brace yourself for a shock. Something is about to take place and you are going to find it hard to believe. I am about to raise up Babylonians to punish you 
Babylonians fierce and ferocious, world conquering Babylon, grabbing up nations right and left, a dreadful and terrible people making up its own rules as it goes. Their horses run like the wind and attack like bloodthirsty wolves. A stampede of galloping horses thunders out of nowhere. They descend like vultures circling in on carrion, and they are out to kill. Death is on their minds. They collect victims like squirrels gathering nuts. They mock kings, poke fun at generals, spit on forts, and leave them in the dust. They will all be blown away by the wind. Brazen in sin, they call strength their god. Then Habakkuk says, God, you are from eternity, aren't you? Holy God, we're not going to die, are we? God, you chose Babylonians for your judgment work? Rock solid God, you gave them the job of discipline. But you can't be serious. You cannot condone evil. So why don't you do something about this? Why are you silent now? This outrage. Evil men swallow up the righteous and you stand around and watch? You are treating men and women as so many fish in the ocean, swimming without direction, swimming, but not getting anywhere. Then this evil Babylonian arrives and goes fishing. He pulls in a good catch, which again, should immediately remind you of Jesus. He mm -hmm. catches his lemon and fills his bucket. A good day of fishing and he's happy. He praises his rod and reel, piles his fishing gear on an altar and he worships it. It's made his day and he's going to eat well tonight. Are you going to let this go on and on? Will you let this Babylonian fisherman fish like a weekend angler killing people as if they're nothing but fish? That's chapter one. Yeah. Well, and Just, you can tell hmm. you can tell that Peterson is. Um, I don't know if he's a poet himself. I think he is based off of. He's a wordsmith. He, yeah. he is definitely a wordsmith. And there's there's a three or six part series. I edited this actually a video series, mm -hmm. uh, and for doxology and yeah. pastoral care, right? Um, which you know you can argue about whether you should interview a Presbyterian about <laughs> being a Lutheran pastor, yeah. but they did to their mm -hmm. credit. Uh, and he gets into this uh, in poetry in the Psalms. Right. So I'll link to it. It's mm -hmm. part four here, talking about being basically uh, about being a wordsmith. It's mm -hmm. actually to this point. Yeah. It's really an excellent, you know, it's just a conversation. Um, and he's kind of right. scatterbrained. I had yeah. to make it actually, you know, intelligible well, through editing. Under the Unpredictable Plant by Peterson, which is his mm -hmm. commentary mm -hmm. on Jonah, but it's a commentary on Jonah because he believes the book of Jonah is a template for pastoral vocation. Yeah. So right. everything in Jonah is his reflection on his failures as a pastor. Yeah. And then when he moves out to Montana and takes up that little congregation, and that was given to me by our friend uh, was Sorla. Was that like Kalispell or something was the name of the town? Kalispell. Kalispell? Yeah. Is that Kalispell. the one? I think yeah. that's it. I think that might yeah. be it. And I read that and I thought to myself, this is so helpful. And, and I really wish I would have read this at seminary. <laughs> Or coming well, I know I, I fully embraced it as like, okay, yeah, no, this is the model for, <laughs> uh, right. I, it's it's at least the model I was given to live yeah. by, right? I mean, yeah. one way or another. Right. Excuse me, but I'm going to hit yes. record. Yeah, let's do that. Uh, where's my record button? <sighs> so out of practice. Audio hijack. Isn't that what? No. <sighs> I'm the professional here. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Now I'm recording. Beautiful. All right. And bump, uh, war chant. There we go. Not so quiet. Wow. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the podcast. This is the Band Books Podcast, episode number 249. And as always, we are your hosts, Christopher Gillespie. Chilling and willing, maxing and relaxing. Very much so. Yep, Gillespie's been up since 4.30 this morning. He beat me out of bed. Yeah, I, I even time. went to bed late. It's, you know, it's really wrecked my uh, body chemistry because oh, I, sure. you know, I pull out, I drink the coffee right away. Mm -hmm. So then I get my cort cortisol getting all yeah. wrecked. By, by about two o'clock in the afternoon, I'm worthless. Well, that's your whole day right there. I yeah, think. so then I take then I take a nap and then I have a second day. Yeah, exactly, yeah. That's it. That's your only option. And uh, I'm sure you already know I'm Donovan Riley. And mm -hmm. uh, we took a break after Easter uh, because we both had a chest cold. Um, you had oh, yeah. a lot of work, and I took a knee to the face, and I had to let my nose heal. So, <laughs> so we took a week. And uh, Well, but the back. podcast, the, the audio versions were You're behind right. anyway. So right. anybody on the podcast version didn't even notice. It's mm -hmm. only the people who watch live on uh, right. the streaming platforms. 
And we're so Fridays. Uh, what's the word? Uh, reverently free? Re- free that uh, you probably don't even notice if we're herky jerky or out of practice and haven't talked in over two weeks. Uh, maybe I don't know. We'll let the audience decide. Our yeah, beautiful we'll find audience. out. Thank Spe- you for speaking being of, with us. I'm going to be traveling next Friday, but I'll be on the road. Mm. So if you don't mind distracted driving, if that's not a thing, I mean, maybe we can do it live while I'm driving. That might Ooh. be interesting. There we go. I, I mean, you do most of the talking real. anyway. I can. <laughs> I'm going to be on one interstate for like right. seven hours. So so my 19-year-old like... son, we're sitting there on Easter Sunday, and we had a birthday party for my uh, friend's girlfriend. Was this distracted driving? or Pretty much, yeah. Okay. So we're Good. sitting there in the kitchen hanging out talking, and, and my 19-year-old son's there, and he, he says something. I'm like, can, like, can you give it a second? Because Josh and I are we're having a dialogue. He's like, mm-hmm. no, you're not. You're monologuing, and he's interjecting. And everyone just explodes <laughs> laughing, and it's like, yeah, okay, <laughs> that's that's actually right on the head. Okay, I don't know. I mean, f- I think leave it to your children to. <laughs> I know this might be truth. a little bit too much diagnosis, but basically, what I found is that um, you'll let people talk once you are like you trust them. <laughs> yes, <laughs> so, <laughs> but there you go. it takes it takes a little while to establish that that maybe that person is going to have something interesting and worthwhile my listening to <laughs> before I'm going to so, allow them okay. to speak. Since you <laughs> since you've hit the nail on the head once again, here's the thing: <laughs> I. I am an enemy of boredom, and right. I cannot stand boredom. And after I spent 18 years in higher education, two bachelors, a master's, and a PhD. <laughs> Speaking of boredom, oh my! I've been a pastor now for 15 years, actively, and I cannot. St- people ask me why don't you go to pastors' conferences because they're uh-huh. boring. The I'm doing that there next are, week. They're they're boring. Everything about it is boring to me. Well, you know what about seminary? It was boring. I can't stand boring people. I can't stand talking to boring people because... Not, I mean, that's probably not entirely true. I mean, you just sought out the not as boring professors and classes. Yes, because the other professors were boring. Correct, yeah. They, they would just stand up and give the same lecture they give every semester to a different class of people. They weren't engaged. They weren't excited. You could see they weren't excited. They, there was no excitement in what they were doing. Because it and, wasn't dynamic. Yeah, it wasn't dynamic. It wasn't provocative. It wasn't evocative. Meaning it didn't change based off of the people no. sitting in front of you no. or what's going on in the world at the, right. contemporaneously right. Exactly. or or and what they've read that morning. Right. It doesn't even I, matter. I was a TA then at the seminary in master's and PhD program for four years or three years the first for my master's and then six years for my PhD. So I was a nine, nine years I was a teaching assistant. So I sat in classes for nine years, semester after semester after semester. Nine years you'll never get back. And they'll, the students ask the exact same question every semester, so the p- teacher gives the exact same answer every semester. So if you find me at a fifteen seventeen conference sitting with Jim Nestigan or Stephen Paulson, if at any point in the conversation you want to stop listening to them but still want to hear what they're thinking, I can tell you because I sat with them for nine years. I've memorized all of their lecture notes. It's just boring um, in a good way for those two, but it's still boring. And I'm going to be 51 this summer. I don't have a lot of time left on this earth to waste listening to boring people. So if I don't trust you, and I don't (laughs) trust that the conversation we're about to have is gonna be engaging, I don't wanna have it with you. Right. I'd rather find someone who is not boring to talk to. So I kinda have two modes, because I have that mode, uh, Mm -hmm. unfortunately, and that's like my professional mode. Um, (laughs) I mean, that's why I like teaching children, because Mm -hmm. they don't, they don't, well, you can tell if they're bored very quickly, they don't hide it. they'll tell you. Yeah. They'll tell you, and um, and it, they're more than happy to be very dynamic and creative and free flow yes. and right. you know abstract and whatever. They're right. they're happy with that, um, or at least imaginative in a general sense. Mm-hmm. Um, but I have the other mode too, which is like if there's somebody interesting, then mm-hmm. I, I'm happy to just sit here and kind of put the coin in the slot. Oh, and, absolutely, and get yeah. you going and yeah. send you in directions or whatever, because mm-hmm. that's interesting too. I don't have to necessarily monopolize the conversation. Um, as long as I can right. kind of keep steering it and directing it in places right. that are interesting to me. Well, that goes to the point we were talking about before we hit record is um, going back to my pulse and, and, mm-hmm. and engaging Steve again. I don't find myself talking or th- like internally I'm not talking when I'm, when I'm engaged with Steve. You're not reading it out loud like in your yeah. head. Yeah. Um, or listening to his sermons or listening to lectures or you know, zooming in for things. It's like I can just sit and let him talk. And my brain is saying, yeah, that's a better way of saying what you're thinking. <laughs> and so I'm just absorbing, absorbing, absorbing because I'm engaged. Well, and, and that's that's what I found too. Mm-hmm. I mean, a lot of times for me, not having had him as a teacher, mm-hmm. the content is unique. Yeah. Um, 
you know, I haven't heard it, uh, you heard that before, but most of the time it's exactly what you said. I haven't heard it expressed that way before. Right. Right. And and like you were talking about with the message before we went, you know, yeah. live, it's like, yeah. I know it's controversial, but it's, it's creative expression. And you, mm -hmm. so you listen and you're like, Hmm, that, now right. it's got me thinking, right? And it's right. Like, that's interesting. Right. That's Why interesting did he choose that turn of phrase? Right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I catch myself saying things that aren't explicitly scripture, but are helpful with, you know, just turns of phrase to, to right. encapsulate maybe an idea. Like, um, don't make God your enemy is one I right. like to use. And I'm yeah. like, I don't know who I picked it up from. Mm -hmm. um, it's not actually in the Bible, like explicitly. No. But you see what happens when people do it all the time. Right. right. <laughs> right? He's like, oh, well, that you Paul, would listen to me. Right. Paul runs yeah. with that in Romans, though, that. Sure. You know, he breaks down that wall of division. He reconciles us to God. And it's like, well, God's not your enemy. But mm -hmm. you go back to Genesis 3, where it says, yeah, I'm going to put enmity between you and. Uh huh. Yeah, there's that word. Child. And you're like, enmity. oh, okay. Yeah. Well, maybe we need to actually you know, come up with another way of saying that. And your way is better because it's colloquial and people can understand it. Yeah. And that, yeah. to me, God doesn't like, want to be your enemy either. Correct. He's not. You're, yeah. He's the enemy of sin, death, and Satan. You just happen to live in their kingdom. Yeah. You know, your you're side. in their neighborhood, yeah. you're in their zip code, and he's got to come <laughs> and get you out of there. But yeah, I think that's the, the, the challenge of the pastoral vocation is to not simply regurgitate trite cliches and, and platitudes because those are the things you heard growing up or those are the things you were taught to say right. at the seminary, but rather constantly challenge yourself as a teacher and a preacher without completely jettisoning God's word, obviously, right. hopefully. Well, and I, th I think the other aspect, and I've encountered this um, fairly strongly recently, well, mm -hmm. I think through the whole my whole ministry is, you know, they see catechesis as having a terminus, like an endpoint. Yeah, yeah. And... And it's like, no, I mean, like the small catechism even, I, I think Luther even says this explicitly in, in some way mm -hmm. in the preface, it's meant to open up the scripture to you. Right. Not not to limit your knowledge or to say, right. here's what, it, 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 it is It is a limital, like mm -hmm. this is what must be believed in order to be saved, right? right? Uh, you know, as far as a public confession. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not meant to be like, that's all you know from the scripture. Right. And when I was talking to the, I went to a pastor thing, you know, and that's where I do dominate because I'm like, this is boring. Mm -hmm. uh, the conversation just kind of get in all of them is like uh oh what stories do you tell right and i'm like you know i like stories like um i don't know eglon right he's one of my favorites yeah, it's fantastic like, really like how does that you... not provoke some like something well it's it's as visual as you can get i mean he's so fat that that swallows up the sword like, yeah that's really fat yeah <laughs> this is like job of the hut fat i was yeah. gonna say I, I go straight to return of the jedi i mean like how do you not <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that was the inspiration, there we right? Go. And so there's that. Just just let let the let the scripture open up, and even if it's right. the stuff that's a little weird and whatever, and you don't mm -hmm. understand, it's like fine. You just enjoy it, right? Well, it it goes to the point too. This is something Paulson said recently in a, a sermon his I was listening to. Is that God's word is is uh, clingable? It clings to you. God's word, when it's proclaimed, it doesn't just float around in the air like in the ether, waiting for you mm. to find some meaning to attach to it. But it actually attaches itself to you in such a way that you can't get it off of you. And that, that then, that analogy... Like viral that, almost. Almost. Yeah. Airborne but when you virus. preach that to people on Sunday morning and you're like, it's clingable, it's sticky. And once it clings to you, you can't get it off. That's visceral. So the people on Sunday morning who are half awake or distracted by their baby or whatever the reason is that they're not engaged because they're sinners, that... that so on, on Easter Sunday... Hmm. Um, I ripped off another Paulsonism, which is he stinketh, because in the King James, right, right, for Lazarus had been dead three days, right. and it says he stinketh. So I repeated that every other paragraph about Jesus. I always he wondered stinketh. who I got that from, but it must have been the Paulson yeah. sermon. Guess what? It's now been almost what three We're weeks. Still since talking Easter? about it. They're still yeah. talking about he stinketh. They're still talking about the big fat butted God who plops down on the scales of justice. Uh -huh. When my elder came up to me, he's like, "I don't know if that's an appropriate uh, analogy, Pastor." I'm like, "It's from Exodus 20." And I read it, and he's like, oh, that's a good one. I'm like, the point ah. is he still remembers it. Yeah. Yes, they still remember these things. And I think that's the thing, like this Sunday with the Good Shepherd and talking about the law and the wolf and the Pharisees trying to put the sheep in a pen. That's provocative, and it's going to cling to them. It's going to stick to them. And I think that for you and I, we love words. And for us, there's a certain, you know, quote-unquote, magic to words. And a person who's good with words, to us, is. It's like a spell where he just, he casts a spell on you. That's why, by the way, when you're watching a play 
or a movie or a TV show and you realize that you were not paying attention anymore to the acting, like you just, you're like, you just gave control of your mind over to the people on the screen and you, oh, this is a really good movie because I actually stopped thinking about it being a movie and I was just wrapped up in the story. There's almost like, again, like a spell being cast over you, an enchantment. Yeah. And so Did as a you... pastor, oh, go ahead. I'm going to say, as a pastor, when we're handling God's word, who is Jesus, I get that, sen that same sense of kind of rapturous, like uh, John Donne's Holy Sonnets, when the first time I read them, the words are so chewy that you just want to like sit in Holy Sonnet 11, just kind of, oh, good yeah. words. Yeah, well, uh, we've talked a lot about, or mentioned it, I, I should say, a, a few times, um, the Hocus Pocus, origin yeah, of that, pocus, right, as a spell. Cor corpus meum. Right. I didn't know Abracadabra was one, too. So <laughs> this is very interesting. So it's a mm -hmm. Roman sage from the 2nd century that mm -hmm. that uh, says it has the, it has this magic, like, talisman kind of character yeah. to it. Mm -hmm. But if you, if you start to do uh, more, like, etymology of it... Yeah. Um, it could come from the Hebrew for Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Yes. Aben yep. Ruach, ka mm -hmm. Hakadesh, right? Mm -hmm. And then, uh, or it could be from Aramaic, Avra Kadavra. Yeah. Which means it's like it's just the killing curse it. from Harry mm -hmm. Potter. But it, um, yeah, that's what I heard too. It's like mm -hmm. let the thing be destroyed. Yeah. In Aramaic, which right. is like, and they're like, no, this is a two thousand year old phrase. We're still saying it, right? As if it's like magic word but what i thought was funny about it is like okay whether it's aramaic or hebrew either way mm -hmm. i think it's probably mm -hmm. the aramaic yeah that the roman guy in the second century picked it up and thought it had some kind of like magic yeah you know effect right uh as a formula and it's like no words actually do have mm -hmm. um meaning of course we believe god's word is does what it says right right it's uh what do you what's the word for that it's efficacious it's mm -hmm. uh what was i gonna say inerrant inspired What's well, this was word? a point I shared with you yeah. last week, though, the difference between potentia and mm. power, that God's word has no potential. It is sheer power. Our words are nothing but potential. So going to Alibaba and the 40 Thieves, where that's the first place I ever heard the, the term abracadabra, because that's the password that opens up the hidden cave. It causes the rock to slide aside, which is throughout all of mythology, which is where Tolkien got it when they get to the mines of Moria, and they can't open up the, the door to the minds, right, right? Right, And right. it says, you know, uh, what does it say, friend, or, you know, something about saying you're a friend? Oh, right, right, on the door. I can't remember. Yeah. Speak, friend, um, enter. Oh, spe so. Yeah, speak, friend, and enter, right. And they, there's no comma, so they read it wrong. They're like, speak, comma, friend, comma, and enter. And so there's, there, and, and I don't know, we've talked about on the show before, basically, all magic and incantations are a bastardization of God's word. I watched this again. I was watching a Polish TV show yesterday. And it's all about magic and the supernatural and Polish mythology. All of their rituals involve words and incantations and some sort of um, circle, right? You have to draw a circle with runes on the ground and you put the person inside the runes and it oh, traps yeah. the, right, the demon right, right. or, you know, whatever. But if you look at that in terms of the Lord's Supper and the words of institution as an example, an obvious, what do you have that with the words of institution? This is my body, this is my blood do this in remembrance of me, this mimetic event. Whereas we say, no, Jesus is actually physically present under the bread and wine for you to eat and drink. But all incantations require a process to bring about an exorcism or a summoning or a bewitchment, an enchantment, a curse. But it's all an inversion of God's word where we mm -hmm. seize power from God and now our words aren't pure potential, they're power. Right. This is why you need to na know the names of angels and demons in medieval alchemy. Hmm. If you so know you their real name, them. you can yep. summon them and control them. But this is why Moses says to, and, but it's ancient because Moses says to God, "Tell me your name." Right. Tell me who sent. Yeah. Who shall I say sent me? Because if I know your name, I know you in that yada intimate sense, which means I have power over you. Hmm. So yeah, there's something there about names, about words, about God's word versus our words, us wanting to be God in God's place, and of course we can't be so. We just invert everything. That's why all mythology about guys fighting dragons comes from the garden. Of course. Right? It's all, it's all there. It's all in our um, cultural, social history, our kind of genetic, social genetic history. But in the present tense, like we've talked about then, we, we think that mythology is fairy tales rather than a communication of the universe in ways that we can understand to the point 
So when you get up in the pulpit and start to preach, why are you not tapping into these ancient wisdom traditions, which are, I'm trying to explain something that's unexplainable <laughs> to a group of people who can only understand things in terms of their five senses and the world they can, they can see, taste, touch, and feel every day. So how do you communicate to a grasshopper what it means to be a man? Well, that's the challenge that God has when he becomes a man and tries to communicate to people, this is what it means to be God. Yeah. So he doesn't tell us everything. He tells no, us what he we can't. Need to know. He tells us what we need to know. I'm going to be present physically on every altar simultaneously, but simultaneously, I exist in the third heaven. It doesn't really go into a lot of detail about that. No, no, no. <laughs> I mean, and like you said, you, you teach it's it. True, it's true, but... wild. Yeah, it's true. Um, but that's where faith has to take over, I think, because it violates yeah. our reason. Where two or three are gathered in my name. Right. Mm. And then you're like, well, wait a minute, what's the implications of that? Well, there right. are a lot. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Same time, same different places. But he just world. drops it and moves on. Like he's that's just like a sentence in a long excursus. Well, but it's enough. I mean, yeah. we were talking about children. I mean, just mm -hmm. receive it as a child. Right. Like, okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, how can this be? Well, why do I need to know what it means, right? Or something right. like that? This is what is it? That's what right. it is. Which is a nice segue into our topic today because enlightenment in a in a ancient Near Eastern sense is literally God's going to like in Habakkuk, God gave me to see it. Literally, God turned the lights on so you can see clearly right. this is reality. Versus enlightenment in the three hundred years ago, right before the Industrial Revolution, sense of inside out, right? Yeah. It's in another yeah. inversion of enlightenment. Rather so than in outside our catechism, in, yeah. revelation, it right. comes from within. In our catechism, in the third article of the Creed, which I'm given to quote constantly, the Holy Spirit enlightens us with his gifts. If you read that in a postmodern sense, that means he gives you internal or uh, Socratic knowledge. Yeah, but that's a pre-modern sense too, right? Isn't that like a, the fire that he sparks within you? No. That, well, it's a medieval Right, thing. It's a Renaissance thing. It's not an ancient Near Eastern thing. Ancient Near Eastern enlightenment is somebody has to come from outside of you and show you. Whereas from the Renaissance forward, it's no, the truth is in you, and I have to help coax it out of you like well, a midwife. It, 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 that doesn't even make any sense anyway, because light comes in through your eye, into your yeah. eye. It doesn't yeah. come out of your eye. Yeah. Yeah. But notice the statues of Moses, the light comes out of his head and goes up. Well, he's reflecting the glory of God, I suppose, but... sure. But in Why does he have art, horns, by the way? Why does Moses well, those are horns? rays of light. They're not supposed to be horns. They're supposed to be rays of light. I like him better as horns, though. I know. It's more fun because you're like, is that Dionysius? Is that, or is, is that a clown? Or... Is he a clown? Oh, I got to send you that video. We you did send me. Let's pot. not talk about it. That's a fun. It's fun, though, isn't it? <laughs> I only I watched the first part. I didn't know he had two more parts. <laughs> yeah, it's fun. No, it's totally fun. I dove in on the second part and then went back and watched the first. And I was like, I don't accept what you're saying, but... I appreciate your ability to recognize a pattern here. And if that well, is true, it, it explains Attack on Titan, for example. Yeah, or right. Killer no, clowns, but. I, I do. Th we're talking about uh, Nephilim and clowns being contemporary or being, yeah. you know, clowns being a reflection of that. I wonder, because uh, we, we've learned about epigenetics mm -hmm. and how you, you do. Cultural memory. and Yeah, yeah. there's cultural And it is passed down. It's genetic in a way. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you kind of know things in different and cultures. And there are elongated skulls with red hair on them that they've dug up. So right, right. Fill in the exactly. background. This exactly. isn't just speculation. Right. And we've had this with other things, like sacred trees are that way. Yes. Well, I mean, yeah. is that just a, maybe that's just like the garden and there's well, the trees. Well, think about, I was just reflecting on this because my wife's from Oregon and her parents have all these old lumberjack photos that they've collected over the years. Mm -hmm. And even just back in the 1880s, there's 20 guys standing at the base of a tree and they don't, they're not as wide right. as the, as the base of the tree, Right. Right. So we know there were trees that were the size of houses around and bigger all in the way Oregon. up until the 1900s. Mm -hmm. And yet, when you look at Yggdrasil, right, the tree of life in Norse mythology, if you look oh, yeah. at yeah. Uh, in Incan and Mayan mythology, they also have the tree of life. If you look at the tree in the garden and the tree of, of uh, life, all of these are world, quote unquote, world trees. And they're in every story from every culture on earth. Yeah, and then you you see it picked up in like more recent fiction, right? You've yeah. got that with Tolkien with the the tree at uh, yes. what is that? Uh, in uh, yeah, the, Minas the, Tirith. Is it Minas it, Tirith? In the with the Wood Elves, right? Oh no, that there's the forest. No, I'm thinking about the one tree at the, um, you know, when Aragorn returns, when the king returns, mm, yeah, yeah, and yeah, then yeah, it blooms right. finally. Yeah. Right? yeah, yeah, yeah. Which comes, that's not in the movie, right? 
It well, it kind of is. It's at the end when he's when he's yeah. coronated. Yeah, and it's then not as big Al- a deal. Erwin shows up. But yeah, um, the book, the, it's a big deal. Yeah. But you also have what was the other tree? Oh, there's actually a pretty strong tree thing going on in um, uh, Game of Thrones. They've got that as well. Yeah. 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 So you see, these people are trying to write like mythological mm-hmm. style writing, and it's like they pick up on it. No, they're sacred trees. That's the thing, and yes. they're large, and they're yeah, very large. Are, oh, there's the there's the one tree in uh, Harry Potter as well. Mm-hmm. That's by uh, by the big guy's house. Right. Can't well, remember. I talked about that. Soren Kierkegaard, we're way off the topic, but we haven't talked in a while. So Soren Kierkegaard, there's a book you can get on Amazon. It's called The Parables of Kierkegaard. It's a lot of fun. And in Elden Ring, they have one too? Cool. I haven't played it yet. Um, so Kierkegaard, long story short, because it's a longer parable. But anyways, in this village, every winter, the elders of the village go out and they put a giant fist-sized diamond in the middle of the ice in the middle of the lake. And then every spring during the thaw, they have this competition where all the young men in the village put on their skates and they skate out to the middle and they attempt to grab the diamond out of the ice. And whoever grabs it out of the ice without falling through the ice and dying, they write songs in honor of of this hero. They build statues. The kids are taught about these, like be like this guy when you grow up. Generations go by. The competition goes by. People fall through the ice and die every year. So finally the elders decide, you know what? It's too dangerous to have them just skate out there and grab at it. So let's do this (laughs) instead. Whoever can touch it without falling through the ice, he wins. So this happens. The guy touches it, but and they, they sing songs about him. They teach about him in school, but it isn't too long before they stop building statues because it's not as great as the previous generation. It's not as, as praiseworthy because they, they didn't grab it out of the ice, so they're not as brave. But young men are still dying all the time in this competition, so generations go by, and they decide, you know what? It's too dangerous to skate out there and, and touch it. Let's just have a competition. Whoever gets the closest wins the competition, mm. and they do it this way. So, of course, they sing their songs, but... The statues, not built anymore. The kids, they're not really taught about it, but there's, you know, there's days set aside to celebrate the feats of these men who you know, are brave. But then within generations, they decide, you know, there's just too many young men falling through the ice dying. So let's just get rid of the competition altogether. And so what happens is that the statues are neglected or torn down. Songs are no longer sung and children are, lo- are no longer taught about these men as if they're real. They're taught about these men as myths, as fairy yeah. tales. They're not yeah. real. And so the children now grow up with no sense of heroism, no sense of bravery or courage, no sense of adventure, because what was true is now taught as a fairy tale. So that, not a single child ever skates out on the ice, falls through and dies. Safety replaces heroism. Where have we heard that before? Yeah, nerfing And I wonder if it's not the same thing, though, of, you talk about the the tree of life, um, the world tree, you talk about the dragon in the garden. You talk about, um, Jesus, you know, Odin hangs himself from the tree to come back from the dead and save the, save the, the world. And they're like, well, see, that's why Christianity is a fairy tale because other cultures have the same story. Mm. Yeah, but this one came first. And everybody else is aping it. Yeah. And I think the order of operations is important. Um, you know, which came and first. And also who edited those Norse texts. Right. They, they were monks. Monks Christianized Beowulf. They cra- they Christianized the Norse myths. Right. They dressed them up fancy, you know. So um, to the to, <laughs> to, to, to what we're actually going to look at. Yeah. This is what's interesting about this Haman character because we we talked about him. Did we read something? Or we just talk about him. I think we just he talked was about him. Referenced in maybe Saze. I had or... sent you something that was really heavy duty, and we're like, eh, yeah, we can't really read this. Yeah. And we needed something a little bit more well entry level. Mm-hmm. Um, you know. Mostly because we didn't want to do all the work, but never yeah. mind. Um, what what happened with Haman? I mean, he's he's in the Enlightenment school. Uh, you know, he's he's a contemporary of Kant. Mm-hmm. And he comes out of Germany, ends up in uh, London, and he ends up and he finds an English Bible and he reads it, and it opens it just opens him up. You know, yeah, to to the light and to you know experience of of storytelling mm-hmm. and it and then obviously the the scriptural you know the actual dogmatic yeah. content too. Yeah. Um, you know, which isn't, in, it's just interesting at this point because we live in this like very, I think we live in a very mythological time now, even though, you know, postmodern is very mm-hmm. like, everything is myth and legend, even like things like politics. Yeah. You no. Know? <laughs> right. And there's no reality and it's all, you know, artificial it's a fiction. constructs. Reality is yeah. a fiction. Yeah. 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 And so you can see how, you know, it's kind of the inverse of this, but apparently um, uh, this Haman character has, you know, found, to have many insights into kind of like where the enlightenment was driving, even to postmodernism. He even kind of foresaw yeah. that in his, in his more heavy philosophical writings. Yeah. And so, um, so that's why the scriptures then for him have this like 
this import because because you can actually tell the true story to people who think of everything as a story yeah right so anyway no, I, actually, I think it's a great point because I think this is part of the conflict that's happening right now culturally in the United States is you and I have obviously been hammering on this for two and a half years of there's objective reality and yeah. then there's fiction. And people have asked us, what do you mean reality is a fiction? I don't mean, I don't mean like reality in and of itself is... No, your belief. subjective experience of it is yeah, but full of stories. We yeah. force objective reality to conscript itself. We conscript objective reality into our subjective reality and we say, no. Um, you're a birthing person. <laughs> right, it's like, right. no, you don't have a uterus. You're a man. It's like, well, right. no, I'm a woman. No, you're not. You don't have a uterus. Only what, only a person with a uterus can give birth. Well, here's what I think it is. I think we make ourselves into the, like the lead actor in the story. Yes. Right. And right. the scripture forces you out of that mindset to right. say, it, it's not that you're immaterial or that you're not important. No, you're quite important. Your number of mm-hmm. hairs on your head are you know, right. numbered and everything, but you're part of a bigger story. Right. I preach on this this weekend. I ask that question because everybody does this with parables. Where mm-hmm. do I fit in the parable? It might not be about you at all. It may just and the, be Jesus. And the point of Jesus' parable is Jesus will tell you who you are in the parable, where you fit in the parable, and what you're supposed to learn from it. He doesn't leave it up to you to speculate, which is kind of the point of Capon's three books on the parables of you're not the word, you're not the sower, you're not the no. star. No. You're at best, you're the, you're the plant that grows out of rocky soil. Correct. Yeah. 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 And uh, what is, well, Peter does that at Pentecost. Mm-hmm. So you'll, you'll get it there too, where it's like, uh, what was your role? You crucified Jesus. Yeah. Okay. There you go. <laughs> Done. And for, yeah. for the heroes at Pentecost, I mean, many of them were there crying out, crucify him. Yeah. So yeah. fair enough, but I, it's still applicable, right? That's yeah. your role. You, yeah. know, you, you don't have to like it, but that's what you did. And maybe that's the primary conflict for what well, was definitely for Haman. It was the primary conflict, especially coming out of, uh, what would it be like the 18th? 50s, mm-hmm. or even earlier than 17, that. no. 1750, yeah. 1750. And he's the son of, I mean, he, yeah, he yeah, was, yeah. Kant was, was racing. Mid 1700s, Schleiermacher was slightly before him in the 1730s. If you, and Hegel came in the 1780s. Here is childhood, 1730, 1746, born in Kernersburg, uh, East King Prussia. City. Older yeah. son of a Lutheran middle class family, whose father, the son of a Lutheran pastor, so he's mm. a grandson of a Lutheran pastor, was a surgeon and the manager of the city bathhouse. <laughs> So hmm. you run the bathhouse and you're the surgeon. Hmm. Yeah. Well, you know, you got a side gig. I like that. Pays the bills. You know, I guess. Right. A little left so over. Ha- yeah. Haphazard primary and secondary education. He ends up studying theology but never graduates. Switches to law Although in Kernersburg. you know what happened in bathhouses back in the 1700s. Oh, I can only imagine. That's where all the, the, well, that's where all the leaders of the city would meet and have meetings. He collaborated with the Circle of Friends to produce Daphne, a weekly journal for women. What? Hmm. Huh. Yeah. Didn't didn't get a degree, but ended up as a tutor. That's cool. And then I bet you, you know, every uh, every uh, publication was a different mystery. Yeah, but Daphne. I've all a group thing, of kids traveled around with their dog and solved mysteries in small towns. So it turned out I, to be an old man in a costume. So you know, as he's uh, he's a tutor. I mean, that's why he's in academics, yeah. but but not like with a university degree. And so Good he's just. Him. But in East Prussia, I mean, you're interacting with Kant. You're interacting. I mean, they, that's the popular right. you know, topic of the day academically. Mm-hmm. Yep. So well, let's dive into Johann Georg Hamann. This is the introduction, according written by John Kleinig, who we yep. have. Have we read John Kleinig? Mm, well, we've no. referred to him many times. We, just we haven't actually read out, anything. Where is Where is John vilified? I don't. Do people vilify John? Uh, I, I find it well, in his own church to... body, it's over the ordination True. of women. But, there we go. Yeah, in Australia, uh, right? I just I find it hard to vilify John on any level because he's so no. likable and engaging, and he has an Australian accent. Which oh, we actually promoted the Leviticus commentary. Y- there we go. Yeah, yeah, that's right. We talked about that, uh, and then the Hebrews commentary, which mm-hmm. is its companion, New Testament companion. Right. I love Kleinig. He one, he's a student of Saze and is great interpreter of Saze, and two, he's just a great pastoral voice. I yeah. Think. Well, I I mean I've learned his exegetical method by way mm. of his students, mm-hmm. which it's just like. It's very similar to uh, Nagel's method, which mm-hmm. is, you know, what what doesn't belong here, you know, when you're right. reading the story. What, what mm-hmm. sticks out? What, what yeah. seems out of place? Maybe mm-hmm. that's what you should focus on. Yeah. Right. Whether it's a word or a phrase or a, mm-hmm. a, an event or that's whatever. That's funny that you were taught that because I was taught that by Nestingen. When you're reading, go, why the hell did he say that? 
Yeah, that's exactly. Why, that's the way Nesigan put it. Well, yeah, Nagel's, yeah. Nagel's thing was like, well, what's the part they le leave out? <laughs> yes, the, the ellipses, dot, right. dot, dot. Dot, dot, dot. Go look at that. That's, See what yes. that's about. <laughs> so the first complete English translation of Haman's seminal work, a translation along with the introduction and annotations by Australian theologian John W. Kleinig, lecturer and, uh, emeritus at Australian Lutheran College. The, the, um, the German... Um, text wasn't published till like then 1940, 1949. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then the critical edition didn't come out until 1996. So this yeah. is actually pretty contemporaneous. A lot yeah. of, there's a lot of writings. Lutheran Quarterly has a bunch of journal articles. Yes. Um, Logia's had a few as mm -hmm. well. They, mm -hmm. They're having conferences. So apparently this guy is pretty, you know, mm -hmm. late discovery, pretty important. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Just mostly because he's prophetic, which is what he's, he's going to talk about. He's a bridge to between the old mm -hmm. world and the post or yeah, modern world, so to speak. Yeah. Yep, yep. And one last thing, because uh, it's in the paragraph in the opening p page here about Kleinig, and I want to just stop. If you ever wanted a book on quote unquote spirituality, there's a book that Kleinig wrote. It's called Grace Upon Grace Spirituality for Today. It's great. Oh, yeah, oh, that's it's a great fantastic book. book. Oh, yeah. um, I devotional. highly recommend it. It's yeah. devotional. Anybody can read it. it. I mean, even if you're a teenager, I think it, you can read it and, and get stuff out of it and benefit from it. But I'd, I'd put that definitely in my top 10 as far as books that I would recommend to people. Oh, yeah. And as a primer. Just, it, and it's rich. He, he's, not, mm -hmm. he's not flowery. I mean, he, mm -hmm. he's, he's wordsmith, but he's not flowery. Right. 100%. Yeah. So, Johann Ye -ha Georg Hamann was an 18th century German thinker. <laughs> he, he thought a lot. He was kind of like an amoeba. He didn't really have a body, but he did think a lot. He was a brain. He was a mind who has recently been rediscovered. He is being acclaimed today for anticipating both modernism and postmodernism, recognizing their limitations and offering a path forward. But in 1758, the 28-year-old considered himself a failure. Alone and destitute in London, he picked up a Bible and started reading, whereupon he experienced a dramatic spiritual awakening. This, in turn, became a catalyst for insights he would develop throughout his life and that continue to resonate today. In his London writings, his journals, notes, and reflections written during that period, we can witness Haman's spiritual and intellectual transformation. All right. Um, by the way, this was provided to us um, by the publisher. Cool. So, Thank you. And uh, Ballast Press. It's linked in the show notes. It's the first thing they've published. And uh, the book is not inexpensive. Uh, it's on sale for twenty five percent off. I think twenty percent off. So it's $55. There we go. I was going to say, but 25% of what? 75. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> no, it's, it's lovely. It, there's, he actually has a really cool section on uh, the critique of church hymns. He, oh, I think really? he goes through six hymns. Yeah. Ooh. I know. You're they're not hymns I'm familiar with, but. Okay. doesn't matter. But as long as he yeah. covers how he critiques them, that's fantastic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So he's he just approaching them nice. critically. Yeah. All right. You're driving the car today. So where do you want to start at? Uh, I think we just do the introduction, the sage from the north, Haman okay. and his London writings. Cool. IV, page IV. Uh, page IV. So the greatest sages, like true prophets, are seldom appreciated and understood by their contemporaries and in their own time. They may have some immediate impact, often for the wrong reasons, and gain some followers who tend to use them to promote their own causes, hmm. but they are seldom understood and little appreciated because they are usually out of step with their times and their own cultural context. You know, it's ironic. I just did an episode of my podcast on Nietzsche. Mm -hmm. He says the exact same thing. Yeah. That a true philosopher is always a philosopher for, uh, for the future because he is never accepting and in conflict with the ideals of the day. Because um, it's the zeitgeist. That, that kind of describes our approach to everything, doesn't it? Yeah. I know like, that's why I like. What are we Nietzsche being and, told, and yeah. where's there a lie right. in that? Yeah. Yes, exactly, and that's I think that's Haman's point here. Yeah, it's Nietzsche's or, point is yeah. never trust the popular philosophers or theologians of the day because, in Nietzsche's opinion, they appeal to the lowest. Co they're the cinnabon of philosophy or theology, <laughs> right? They're just like hot topic. The mall, the mall pastry. Yes. Yeah, they're they're just a mall pastry. They're they're just a mall. <laughs> And that's why people like them. That's, you know, for Nietzsche, that's why people like Socrates and Plato, because they just lean into decadence. They lean into that exhaustion of virtue. Like, let's lower the bar so it's easier to jump over it. And let's just stop worrying so much about like the hard questions. Don't worry. But, you're going to regret this tomorrow. But right now, 
right? Just just imagine you're enjoying it. But here's the here's the point. The root point I think for both these men is this: the drive to do that is to make everyone equal, because that mm. was the drive of the Enlightenment and humanism. We're all equal, right? And so to make us all equal, we have to continue to lower the bar, uh, and so greatness raises the bar. So what we need to do is constantly lower the bar so everyone can be great. Everyone can be an Olympic athlete because everyone can jump up six inches. I mean, yeah. six and a half feet. That's an impossible high jump for a normal person. Do you, you, you won't believe this, but uh, I know you're not going to watch Picard season two. <laughs> you're right. So I'm just going to spoil it. Good. Sorry, listeners. It, it's terrible. Um, but I'm a Star Trek fan, so I watched it anyway, Ugh. for better, for worse. They actually rehab the Borg. You know, because the Borg is like collectivism, yeah. right? It's, it's yes. communism. It, yes. It's highly critical. Everybody's the mm -hmm. same. There yeah. is a queen, but, you know, they're, mm -hmm. they all do they much sure better. mind, yeah. And, they, and there's no individuality or particularity, right? There's no sex. There's no gender. Right, exactly. And so, so they rehab it now. And, and anyway, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. the, you're like, oh, I see. Because it's contemporary, right? We're trying yes. to rehab, you know, collectivism yeah. again. And mm -hmm. oh, it's we're going to do it right this time. We fixed right. the Borg because mm -hmm. now they're going to be integrated. You know, uh, no. Uh, but th but this is what happens. It's like why why can't we let like somebody just be a weird person that right. has strange insights and a character? Yeah, a character. And yeah. Who is it that gets discovered after he's dead? I'm trying to think. There's other examples of this. Mm -hmm. You know, whose works aren't discovered until after they die, mm -hmm. and then they get published, and it's like, oh yeah. wow. Who was it this happens guy? in the art world a lot, where you discover artists, oh, poets, just musicians. the past, the artist that just paints and then mm -hmm. is discovered. Yeah, was, after the fact. It? Yeah, I can't think of a good example. I had one, but I, a musician, mm. but I can't think of who it is. Nick well, and Drake. this, is, yeah, I mean, we dis I discover people long after they're gone. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So the greatest sages, like true prophets, are seldom appreciated and understood by their contemporaries in their own time. But they are seldom understood and little appreciated because they are usually out of step with their times and their own cultural context. So their significance only becomes evident after their death, as times change and the dominant culture is more attuned to their insights. Then their guidance is welcomed for personal reorientation in a changed world, like a map for travel in an unknown land. The new mentality provided by their wisdom helps people locate themselves in that new territory. Haman may rightly be regarded as such a sage. One of his earliest disciples, Karl von Moser, called him the sage from the north. And Haman was happy to accept that designation, not because he considered that he was a sage in the contemporary sense of the word as a moral philosopher, but because the German magus identified him with the magi, the wise men from the east in Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. Like them, he followed the star that led him to worship Jesus as the promised Messiah. So, for example, in 1784, he signs off a letter to his friend Krauss with an ironical self-appellation that alludes to both these sages from the East and the tax collector, Matthew, as Magus in Tolonio, sage at the tax booth. Huh. Like his hero Socrates, oops, and the Apostle Paul, he spoke of his ignorance to people who claimed to have sure and certain knowledge of themselves and the world. Like them, he prized the unsettling folly of true wisdom. And that is nowhere more apparent than in his London writings. They show us something of his wisdom and its unlikely provenance. From them, we may understand why Haman has recently been considered an intellectual and spiritual guide by an increasing number of thinkers in a variety of fields. Right, so it's not just theology; it's philosophy, mm -hmm. um, uh, moral philosophy in particular, is one of those things. Yeah. So he's engaging with his contemporaries. Right, and but it's it seems like it seems like what, one of the common themes of these sages, or you might even mm -hmm. call them prophets, mm -hmm. is that it's intensely personal. Yeah, they're they're trying to understand themselves in the world that they live in. Right, and they're not really concerned about whether other people appreciate that. Right. You know, I mean, he it, he does. He takes it in the sense of like, I'm looking for Jesus, right? I'm I'm going to find him. And I think there's a certain magi. monomania that possesses mm -hmm. them. And yeah. yeah, for example, like Haman coming out of Germany, coming out of a Kantian cultural zeitgeist, right. and discovering the Bible, 
and reading the scriptures, because you have to understand Schleiermacher, Hegel, and after him, or um, Kant, and then after him, Hegel, they essentially bastardized the Christian faith while claiming they all went through seminary. They all actually technically were pastors. Right. They, they're all Lutheran. They all attend church. They preach. But, like, again, Schleiermacher wrote a systematic theology. Yeah, he did. That's right. And yet, when you go back and read them today, you can't help but wonder who the hell thought it was a good idea to let these guys have access to the Bible? Because what did they do to the Bible? They simply took it hostage to the prevailing philosophy that they were pushing, and they used it as a vehicle, and they used the religious language and symbolism to drive yeah. the philosophy, which is yeah, what always happens. Right, and you, I mean, the scriptures themselves testify to this in the Old Testament, right? You look yeah. at the Old Testament, the, the, you know, the, the history of the kings. It's mm -hmm. like, whoever it is, I mean, it's not usually names, but yeah. they, they put the Bible on a shelf and they yeah. lock it up, yeah. and that's it. And, it's and like, sometimes, as you've noted, they lose it. They forget about it, and it's rediscovered <laughs> during excavations. Right, and it's, and it's even under the guise of like, uh, well, we'll just let the smart people read it. Mm-hmm. And tell us what it means. Well, we'll let our prophets, who we send to school, who we then appoint to be prophets, they'll mm -hmm. interpret it for us. We can trust them. They're experts. Right, right. I mean, it's almost like a, a prototypical university system. Yes. You know, um, the way that the, the scriptures were approached mm -hmm. by uh, the scribes of, or, you mm -hmm. know, the, during the era of the kings. You know? Right. Yeah, that's interesting. The difference being, though, is that when they dig something up while they're excavating, they actually pay attention and they're like, hey, man, this is important. We, we can't rebury this. Whereas in the contemporary setting, if we dig something up we don't like, we just bury it. We Did I send you the it. I send you the story about the farmer in Palestine that dug up a, yes. like a, a full Canaanite yeah. goddess? Yeah. yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> They're like, what do we do with this? We we don't have like one of her, but we don't have a statue of her. And this guy finds it in the, you know, in the yeah, field. Just, yeah. Going up picking That's it up. Odd. Wouldn't that be great if like there were actually ancient artifacts here that you could dig up that were interesting? Not just more arrowheads. Mm. Yes, wouldn't it be? <laughs> There was overwhelming archaeological evidence in the United States for previous civilizations. Oh, I don't know. There's burial mounds, but that's kind of boring. There's way more than that, my friend. <laughs> I'm not, I baited you a little bit, but we should stick, stick to the text. He was a minor civil servant. <laughs> but anyway, so one might think that Haman would be of little interest to English readers in this new millennium, considering his difficult style and the fact that Enlightenment German is so difficult to translate and how little of his work had been translated into English. He was a minor civil servant who spent most of his life from 1730 to 1788 in the remote province of East Prussia, far from the political, cultural, and intellectual centers of his day. He's making a, he's making a strong case here for us reading it. Right? In his <laughs> spare time, he published a series of obscure works in which he engaged with some of the leading lights in German-speaking Central Europe. Many of them were fascinated by him, even though they did not quite know what to make of him and his writings. He was far too much out of step with his times to be at all directly influential on the mainstream of scholarship and debate. His influence, such as it was, was largely secondhand and indirect through those who had benefited from his provocations. And yet, even they tended to cherry pick some of his insights and use them to pursue their own concerns. Wow, that's new under the sun there. Uh, yeah, I was just about to say, nothing new under the sun. This kind of reminds me of uh, like when we read John of Damascus yeah. on Islam. Mm -hmm. Right? Now, John of Damascus is not a minor figure by it's any stretch. It's our most popular series. One of our most popular episodes, yeah. Um, and I, it's good. Did we do two episodes? I think we did. Yeah, I think so, yeah. Um, this is similar to that. It's like, well, what would be really interesting mm -hmm. is rather than just read like Kant and Hegel and these guys, yeah. which we'll end up doing eventually, because <laughs> that's what we want to do. Yeah. Um, why don't we read somebody who's actually like a Christian? Mm -hmm. Like actually believes the scripture to be right. like true and right. good and useful and actually forgives mm -hmm. sins and, you know, Jesus right. is a real guy and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> and uh, what does he think about these people? You know, somebody mm -hmm. who has, you know, at least an, an, a direct interaction or indirect, as, as Kleinig right. says here. That would be interesting. It's like, well, what's actually going on in the day? Because we have, right. I think we have these like, Larger than life, uh, artificial creations of these people. Mm -hmm. I mean, Hegel, yeah. obviously, with his influence on, on Marx and others. Yeah. You know, that was like, well, who was Hegel actually? You know? Mm -hmm. And was he even really all that significant? In his day, or, yes. His, his lecture hall. Oh, yeah, no. Packed. Right, yeah. right. Wasn't he in Berlin? He was in Berlin, yeah. wasn't he? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, no. We read, I, think, I think we read about that. I think this is the thing. 
because I can meditate the, on this in the present tense as well as the past and reading guys like Nietzsche and Hamann and uh -huh. others. When you are outside the bubble, you are free. You're free from editors. You're free from peer pressure to conform to right. the guild. Right. And again, you and I both experience this. We have friends who experience this is you submit your manuscript, you write your article, you, you drop your blog in the email box, and then it's immediately critiqued for being too this, too that, or too the other thing. And you're going to, you're going to upset people. It's going to, you know, it could right. cause us to lose subscribers. Um, it's going to affect our bottom line. Um, the CEO or CFO or the board of directors aren't happy with what you're, you know, you're saying or doing. So you got to trim it back or we're going to have to kind of jettison you because you're bad for the brand. Again, you're, you're hurting the guild. Yeah, you when don't you fit get, within the model. Right? right. Whereas with a guy like Haman, who's off the beaten path, he's free to think and engage with these people. And even if he writes or says something, because he's not, quote unquote, an authority figure, like he doesn't lecture in Berlin or in Tübingen or Erlangen, he's allowed to think and he's allowed to be curious and let his curiosity take him where it will. He's destitute, as we read. Yeah. He struggles. So he's, he's got the unfaktung and the tentatio. And he's just free to, to go through all this so that the Lord can lead him to the word. And right. then whatever he, how, whatever his reaction is to that word, he's free from the guild to just work it out. Well, I think that maybe this is why we need to have these translated, but there's eight volumes of writings of Leah, yeah. Wilhelm Leah, yeah. um, who helped found our, our church body, actually, mm -hmm. even though he never came here. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but another one that's kind of, has that same kind of story is, is Bonhoeffer, who's yeah. very popular. Mm -hmm. um, maybe, I think, maybe a little overrated, but that's not here, neither here nor there. Well, I mean, the point is, is that he broke out of the system and he had the kind of, what did they, what, did, what was the counter like seminary that they, that they had run in there? Yeah, yeah. You know, and so yeah. he's, he's interacting, but he's not directly under, under right. the umbrella, right? Mm -hmm. So it gives, it gives him some freedom to be, right. um, you know, a little bit more critical mm -hmm. uh, or a lot more critical as the case mm -hmm. may be, right? And Which so, is why he was largely forgotten until mm -hmm. the 90s. When one of his students, Eberhard Bethke, one of his, can you know, started translating yep. his works. Yep, yep, yep. And the same thing happens here. He's not, you know, Haman's got almost two hundred years before he's mm -hmm. really discovered. Yeah, rediscovered. So there's hope. <laughs> right. Well, and I, you know, we've talked about this personally. It's like, right, you know, we're we have small congregations. We do, mm -hmm. you know, you you write some books. I do some podcasting. Yeah. And, you know, if any of our works survive, mm -hmm. that we would consider that a success, probably. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if anything is de deemed worthy to survive at all, right. or if it's discovered later, I guess, right. you know, maybe that's cool. It's like somebody says, hey, you know, there's this, these crazy guys and they seem to know what they were talking about and nobody else was listening. I'm like, mm -hmm. okay, I yeah. mean, that'd be cool too. I mean, it's after right. the fact and won't mm -hmm. really affect us personally. <laughs> right. Uh, that's but, key. But, but I mean, if, if God chooses to use us in that way, right. that, well, that's great. I think that's the point too. I don't think Haman, obviously Haman didn't write for a large audience or write to make money. Well, this was book just, wasn't even supposed to be published. Right. It's just, These are just his journal notes. Journal, exactly. Yeah. Well, I think Marcus Aurelius's meditations. Oh, there's that's, that's not the example I was his, trying to think. Of. That's his diary. That yeah, and that wasn't published until after his death. And fifteen eighty is the it was when it was actually translated, right? So right. that people could read it, right? <laughs> like literally almost a thousand years after he died, or more than a thousand years after he died. Then it's rediscovered. The manuscripts rediscovered. Then it's translated, and then people have access to it. Well, it's the same thing with uh, Odyssey and Iliad. Yeah, you know, that's a thousand years after his death mm -hmm. before we even have yeah. a copy that's extant. It's so crazy because we just, it's ubiquitous now. We take it for granted. Maybe he just wrote it for himself. Yeah, exactly. He's just sitting around the fire telling stories. Somebody wrote it down. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. Especially when you consider what they used to write on, like palm leaves. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. So, East Prussia, civil servant, out of the way. So, many of them were fascinated by him even though they did not quite know what to make of him in his writings. He was far too much out of step with his times to be at all directly influential on the mainstream of scholarship and debate. His influence, such as it was, was largely secondhand and indirect through those who benefited from his provocations. <laughs> Yet even they tended to cherry pick. Okay, Of course. He did have a widespread and indirect influence on three strands of German and Central European culture that are of some academic interest. Here we go. It can be discerned in philosophy via Herder, Kant, Hegel, Jacobi, and Kierkegaard. In literature via Goethe and German Romantic writers such as Jean Paul. And in Lutheran theology via the confessional revival that came in the wake of the French Revolution and the Napoleonic Wars with 
Auguste Vilmar and Wilhelm Lea. But yeah. it did not go much further than that. Only a few specialists were interested in some aspects of his life and his work for historical reasons. Even in Germany, there, were so, there was so little interest in him that only some of his works were issued 40 years after his death. And his complete works were only published by Joseph Nadler in a comprehensive critical edition after the Second World War, from 1949 to 1957. There you go. Dang. Even though Hamann had no direct cultural, intellectual, and theological influence on the English-speaking world. So why are we reading him? Okay, yeah. keep <laughs> Thank you, John. So why did I translate this? Um, he has suddenly become much better known and more highly regarded in current academic discourse. This has come in two stages. The study of Haman by English scholars began in the two decades after the Second World War in connection with the existential philosophy of Kierkegaard and the neo-orthodoxy of Karl Barth and has, continue, and has continued into the new millennium in connection with what is now called postmodernism. In this new context, his work has become increasingly relevant and useful. Big fan of Kierkegaard. Mm-hmm. Uh, Karl Barth. Well, Not. that's a good example too. If you go to a store, Kierkegaard is usually found under philosophy. He is, yeah. Even though much of what he wrote, other than his philosophical writings, are theological, and he's re reflecting yeah, and the I, Bible. <laughs> I remember uh, I have a, I have a you know a grade school friend who um, uh, basically left you know left the Christian Church, but mm -hmm. uh, but did say you know one of the pl entry points that he was still interested in. Um, you know, in, in the faith was through Kierkegaard. Yeah. They, he found that Kierkegaard's observations uh, to resonate. And I think in the same way Nietzsche does for you and that it, mm -hmm. it, you know, it's very skeptical and critical, mm -hmm. um, you know, of the institutional way of the church. Yeah. Of course, we've seen how that plays out now is now we have folks that are just like, well, I'm spiritual, but not religious. I don't go to, I don't need to go to church to be a Christian. And you're like, well, you have to actually deny God's word for that to be true. I would actually that's, argue that's not true anymore. At least for me, in my experience. You, it, well, I think it's reversing. Yeah, it's reversing I think that course. is an artifact of the 90s and early 2000s. Mm -hmm. Because I texted you last week, what I'm encountering, and I, it's been constant now, the, especially the past two and a half years in particular, it's, it's really reached this kind of like crescendo, is I talk to people who read their Bible every day, pray every day, and they're Christians. They believe Jesus Christ is their Savior. They believe the Word of God is true, but they won't go to church. <laughs> because they see that as being a religious cult. They see it as being an institution that's been ghettoized. They're disgusted by the lack of intellectual engagement and curiosity by right. both clergy have, and congregation. Have you said anything that's not true yet? I'm, I'm struggling and, here. <laughs> and I sit there and say, yeah. yes, yes, and yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. And then I have to, I go into, well, Christian freedom and vocation and that whole mm -hmm. conversation and explain to them, yeah, there is a religion. I wrote a book about it <laughs> and where I attack it. Right. <clears throat> so I'm with you, but we have to be, be very clear in our distinction between the old Adam's religion and religion as the new man in Christ confesses the faith and recognize that, yeah, sometimes, again, we clutch onto dead things and worship them as if they're a god. Well, and like or we talked God. about with that, that ebb and flow of like <clears throat> God's word being present and then not present, present mm -hmm. again, just rediscovered and, and, yeah. and you know, back and forth. The same thing yeah. happens with the institution that the word's connected to, with mm -hmm. the, you know, with the faithfulness of the people, right. right? And so those criticisms are perfectly valid, but that doesn't, I mean, we actually believe the church is redeemable as an institution. Right. Well, <laughs> or at least individually or particularly but... in the, well, locally, because otherwise you wouldn't sure. be a pastor. Right. I mean, what? why bother if you didn't think there well, was... But I, I don't believe the institution is redeemable because it's of the law and it's being put to death. Which, by institution, you mean the trappings. You don't actually yeah. mean the Christians gathering together to hear Jesus no, not that receive part of his gifts. Right, that's no. what I'm talking about. Okay, good. All right, I just want to clarify. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like, that's, like, if that's not true, then what's the mm -hmm. point at all, right? Right, right. Yeah, all the other stuff, like, mm -hmm. you know, the uh, the cornhole tournament. I mean, yeah. really? Yeah. Yeah. But no. to your point, then, instead of using the I'm spiritual, not religious, as an excuse not to go to church, mm. what I'm hearing from my friends and teammates is, I want to go to church. I want to be fed. But I refuse to go to that church because I don't hear Christ preached. The Bible studies are vacuous, and I'm constantly asked, what do I think it means? I don't mm -hmm. want to know what it means. I want you to tell me what God says and what God means. Yeah. I want communion. Right. And they're not receiving it, so they feel like they're, well, like Haman's being described here. 
I'm not a part of the guild. I'm not a part of this institution. I don't buy into the trappings because I don't believe that they're God inspired. They're not God breathed. And therefore we can live without them. And it, and what rescues him is God's word. Right. Just reading it. Exactly. And that's my point though, is that you're reading God's word. You're praying that God would actually lead you to a preacher, bring you to a preacher, bring you to into communion with others. Mm -hmm. And then when you go to church, you're be, you just have it beaten out of you again. And just that constant frustration of, I went and I went, and I've talked about this story before. I talk about it in the first book. We went to over 50 churches in four years when I was at seminary, my wife and I, and we would just leave completely disheartened because yet again, here's a sermon without a, even a mention of scripture. I was going to say, that's, it wasn't West Coast either. That You're talking no, about- No, that was Minnesota. That's yeah. Minnesota. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And just the fact that after 50 or 60 churches, you're, you're definitely, can, you're, like, you're thinking it's definitely us. We are the problem. Well, I mean, there is a reality that um, not every preacher can be your preacher. I get Correct. that. that mm -hmm. That's part of the church. Just communication 100%. style, personality, whatever. Well, we're going to church when we have a son who we're told is going to die in utero. And then after he's born, we're told he's going to die before he's three and he needs yeah. brain surgery. He needs skin. He needs bone graft. And so you're, and you know, you know exactly what I'm talking There's about. There's a very specific kind of preaching. You're in the you valley need. of the shadow. Yeah. All the time. Not a case, like literally every single day of your, of your waking life is worry, anxiety, and fear and terror, not just scared. You're in terror and it's exhausting because you're literally terrified 24 seven. Every morning when you wake up, you're like, yep, here we go again with the terror. And yet you're expected to function, work, study, go to church. And what do you hear in church? You're not addressing this on Fectum. You're, and I'm in my PhD studies. So I'm yeah. reading Luther. And then going to Lutheran church is going, have you even ever read Dr. Luther? No. Do you care? <laughs> well, I told you about my, uh, that, that sermon I heard uh, this week. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, it was this week. Was it this week? It was a long week where uh, I was like, this person clearly has not read, uh, mm -hmm. this is one of our pastors, unfortunately, Augsburg mm -hmm. Confession, hasn't read Formula of Concord, yeah. hasn't read Bondage's Will. They have, yeah. They're not preaching anything, you right. know. I mean, never mind, it was a disastrous, you right. know, as far as the order of things, but I can forgive that because I don't often preach in a very linear fashion. So that part I can forgive. <laughs> right. But like, you still need to agree with the scriptures in our confession. I'm sorry. Right. You know. Well, I think the long and short of the moral of the story is if you complain loud enough, God will just make you a preacher ah. and to shut you up. <laughs> well, and that's been our experience. I mean, what you described with your own like personal, ex yeah. you know, um, struggles and, mm -hmm. and trying to find a preacher. I mean, this this happened both in both of our parishes because of mm -hmm. COVID. It was the same story. 100%. Which, by the way, People. if anybody ever wondered, like, I will never not defend Stephen Paulson. I will never take sides against Steve because he was the only preacher that would come to us in the hospital. Right. And That's why. Yeah. 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 And right. so he's my ride or die because of that reason. Yeah. Well, because he showed up. Exactly. And I tell young guys that all the time. They're like, what's the most important thing about being a pastor? And I'll tell them, show up. That's mm -hmm. it. Just show up. Now, Steve and, has the advantage of that he's, he is quite, you know, evocative yeah. and provocative mm -hmm. and yeah, right. he speaks to you, right? Yeah. He can be your pastor that But that's way. the point is God sent me the preacher I needed. Yep. When I'm walking around like, this isn't what I want. This is what I want. And then he sends you the preacher you need. And you're like, oh, that's why I need this preacher. Right. <laughs> but I, I so I was, I was drawing it to, you know, again, to the COVID thing. I mean, we, mm -hmm. number of people that are still like paralyzed for fear mm -hmm. and, yeah. and w how are they going to break out of that? Well, they're not. No. That's the point. Right. Um, but the Lord can break them out, and He's going to do yeah. it through, you know, through preaching. Which, ironically, to your point, it you're you're afraid of death, and if you have a preacher of the cross, He's going to lead you through death to new life. Mm -hmm. Right. If you don't have a preacher of the cross, He's going to lead you through death into death. More of the same. Butterflies and it tulips. Might, it's like I was saying in Bible study yesterday, we all want a Pharisee for a pastor who says, get in the pen, that's how you stay safe from the wolf. Yep. And the smaller the pen. Do what you're pen, told. Yeah, right. right. And the smaller the pen, I, I liken it to like when you're, you're falling asleep and then you wake up with a jerk and you kind of throw your hands out real quick or you're in, you're in the flight and there's turbulence and you just kind of go rigid like that and you jerk, is we want to be able to touch the walls when that happens. Because we have this sense of security with the smallness of our pen, of our cage. When in Hebrew, that in the Psalms, that's the description of original sin. <laughs> is that God put me in a very tight and narrow place. Well, and I was him rewriting my sides. sermon for Sunday. Yeah. <laughs> and Oops. so Jesus comes along and says to the Pharisees, oh, there is no pen, my friend. I'm leading them out into the wide open pastures. And then when the wolf attacks, I'm going to feed him to me so that he's so full of me, he doesn't have any room left in his tummy to eat my sheep. 
Yeah. And the Pharisee's like, no, man, you understand. This is how this works. Get back in the pen. Get yep. back in the pen. You're safe. And so we want to be penned in. And so what COVID did is it gave people that sense of, I can touch the walls. Safety, it's, security. It's mashed yeah. against my face. Mm -hmm. And then Jesus comes along and sends you a preacher that says, no walls. Right. No but distance. why is that terrifying? Because it's unknown. Yes. Well, it, now, now we would yeah. say it's unknown in a sense of like freedom and joy, right? Yeah. The, 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 the joy of freedom, I should say. Yeah. Right, that's lovely. Like, let's go mm -hmm. exploring and see what's out mm -hmm. there. Right. Whereas, <laughs> if yeah. you're if you're living in fear, it's like, right. no, I don't want to encounter other people. I, right. Who knows what would happen? Oh, I might get sick or something. You're afraid of death because you worship a hidden god. The god mm -hmm. who hides himself in death and suffering and affliction is the true god, but he's not there for you. Yeah. In the promise, Jesus is true god in the promise because he promises to lead you through death to new life. And you're, you're stopping in death because that's your God. You're fearful of death, so you worship it. And therefore, you listen to the death dealers and the death mongers because that's, because again, they want to put you in a, literally in a coffin because you can reach out and touch you. you you're contained. You're safe in that false womb. But it's not, it's not a, it doesn't give birth to you. It kills you. It, it's death. Yeah. You worship death. So when you come to a church where the <clears throat> preacher is preaching death and new life, new death and resurrection in Christ, and you're going to be led into the darkness and the unknowingness and then into the light of the resurrection, that's horrifying. Yeah. One, the problem you, it, yeah. <laughs> but the problem is, that's the only story in the Bible. Yes. Every story yeah. is death and resurrection. It's all, it's, yeah. whether it's, I mean, there's the obvious ones like the flood or, yeah. <laughs> or the garden or whatever. Yeah. There's like, I mean, the garden, you the garden of Eden, you have to attach to the garden of the resurrection, right? Yeah. Right. You put those two, then it's bookend. Yeah. 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 Abraham and like, Isaac. Yeah, yeah. Over and over, over and over and over. It's just, you, you have, to, you're going to have to die. Yeah. Yeah. For there to be life. Hmm. Exactly. Which is why you don't get a lot of preachers in the guild. Because the guild, by the way, it's, we've talked about this, you know, again, from Astonished at Heart by Keepin, the yeah. primary mission and purpose of the institution is self-preservation, not grace. And Jesus comes yeah. along and says, I could care less about your institutional boundaries. I'm going to actually going to, I'm going to actually do this outside your law. And that we can't stand. We cannot have a God who functions outside our law. <laughs> it, is, it is kind of, I've thought this interesting. I mean, it, it's true that we, we are under Christ, right? And so we're ordered under him, mm -hmm. subordinate. Um, but I've often thought about like how... Um, you know, <laughs> we're so vehemently opposed to um, tyrannical like authority and power, yeah. and then then we just exercise that in the church. We even yeah. institutionalize it, right? Like, hmm. So we're not really against it. We're against people having that power over other us. people having that. Over yes, us. yeah. There yeah. we go. Exactly. Right, and then and then you and I spent all this time trying to teach people. I was like, um, no, actually, Jesus is the authority here, and right, like you can take or leave your pastor. I mean, it's like yeah. we're gonna come, we're gonna go, we'll be here for a while, and then we'll leave. Yeah. Right, it's like, oh, but but you're the pastor. I'm like, tell us what no. to think. Tell us what to do. No. Yeah, okay, you're free. Go, be free. And they're like, but what happens if I mess it up? I'm like, oh no, you're definitely going to mess it up. That's why I'm here. Yeah, but yeah. that's your whole life up to this point. It's just that God gave you to see it, as He did to Habakkuk the prophet. And right. now that you see it, you can't unsee it. So now you're obsessed with it. But don't worry, those emotions will fade. Yeah, and we're on that journey together. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I know you hate that journey language, but uh, there it I is. Do. So the reason then for this growing engagement with Haman at present is obvious. It stems from the apparent triumph of what is now called postmodernism, with its hermeneutics of suspicion about the Enlightenment, with its faith in human reason and its dominance in all areas of life. And thus John Betts makes this claim for Haman and his appeal, his present appeal. Quote, he was arguably the most brilliant critic of the Enlightenment. The Socrates of Königsberg, the German translator of Hume, the first to read meta oh, and metacritically deconstruct Kant's critique of pure reason. You want to talk about a slog. In short, probably the most interesting and radical thinker the ranks of Lutheran orthodoxy ever produced. Well, that might not be overstating it. I don't know. Well, it's almost like a contradiction in terms to say he was a radical thinker of Lutheran orthodoxy. <laughs> That's like radical hey, thinker in the ranks of Lutheran Orthodoxy. That's kind of a that's kind of a flashy shade of uh, beige you're wearing there. He means in the era of Lutheran Orthodoxy. Yeah, I, I don't I think, think he actually funny. belonged. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and by Socrates, I think he, I think they mean because um, Kleinig mm -hmm. used that too, meaning mm -hmm. like Socratic method. Yeah, I know coaxing out. Yeah. Rather than uh, in contradiction to Hegel, the Hegelian mm -hmm. method. Yeah. Yeah. Right. 
Yeah, I get it. Again, I'm. You're just for those not a big of you who Socrates have fan. not okay. figured this out by now. I don't understand if you haven't been paying attention. If this is your first episode, I'm a student of Nietzsche, and Nietzsche despises Socrates and Plato. And having read his critique, I share his sentiment towards Socrates and Plato. It's a little bit, you know. Again, go what listen to Warrior Priest from uh, April twenty. 20- 7th of night of 2022 <laughs> where he breaks it down and I comment on it but right but arguably yeah. Luther is too I mean that yes that's to be Luther fair Luther attacks him openly and yes, well, exactly. especially Aristotle but also the Platonics because yes Neoplatonism yes. yes via Medina via Medea versus via Negativa yeah right yeah. right blah 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 via Moderna there we go Medea Moderna it's not like I did six and a half years of PhD work on this God, <laughs> that claim is rather provocative, I know. Well, no, says that to me. Well, that claim is rather provocative. Well, by the way, since we're talking about this and you forced me to read YouTube comments <laughs> by sending them to me, knowing my curiosity would get the best of me, that was an entertaining 10 minutes of my life I'll never get back. Oh, um, uh, on uh, Luther, on, on Jews and their lies? Yeah, if I get tumors, okay. it's definitely from reading those YouTube comments. Um, if you haven't figured it out by now, we don't take ourselves terribly serious on this show. And even when we sound serious, we do it with tongue in cheek um, because we realize that we're absurd and uh, we don't know what we're talking about because who really does? So uh, We've read yeah. too much. and we've, Yeah, we've read too much and it's driven us insane. But And there's um, hardly anybody else we could talk to about these true things. True story. <laughs> so uh, just so you know, don't, don't take us that seriously that you actually get upset by the things we say. It's just our opinion. And uh, calm down. Well, there's a uh, lawyer, YouTuber, YouTube lawyer, um, uh, Robert Barnes. I think I've mm-hmm. referred to him yeah. before. Yeah. Uh, he's Viva and Barnes. They have their Viva little show. Viva Barnes, great stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, Barnes has on his um, locals page, which you have to subscribe to, mm-hmm. he does these hush hush episodes, mm. which, which it's conspiracy stuff, right? Yeah. Generally. But one of the things he does is he'll try to present the opposite viewpoint, like a nice. lawyer would, yeah. right? Is to devil's advocate, I guess is what we call that, yeah. right? Um, and he's done these, and it just and it's amazing to see even how fans who contribute so that they can listen to these things mm-hmm. or watch these things, how vehemently upset they get. Like when he goes mm-hmm. the opposite viewpoint on somebody like, um, yeah. uh, who who did I give you? Oh, uh, uh, Elon Musk, right? Yeah. Elon Musk, he's the savior of free speech and all this, and then he'll do the opposite, or... <laughs> right? And he'll just right. he'll dig deep and like mm-hmm. completely the opposite perspective. That's not yeah. necessarily his perspective, yeah. but he'll defend it. And people yeah. can't see that. They can't understand. Like, how could you defend, you know, do the opposite and actually, yeah. you know, either critique or defend somebody mm-hmm. that's indefensible? He's been doing a lot, a lot of, with the with the Russia Ukraine conflict, yeah. right? Right, and presenting the Russian side, which is mm-hmm. largely not allowed to be spoken of. So he yeah. just presents it. Yeah, you don't have to. He, I don't even think he agrees with a lot of the stuff he presents. Right, because who knows what's actually true? Right, mm-hmm. yeah. fog of war. Right. Um. So we do that too. Mm-hmm. We wanted to read on the Jews and their lies, and it's not really defensible. But it no, was. We said it, it was, wasn't. But it was fun to read and to say, yeah, I can come. You know. Well, it's like here uh, the comedian Bill Burr. He's got this this bit called um, "There's no reason to hit a woman," <laughs> and he points out by saying "There's no reason to hit a woman," you've completely cut off everything that led up to that point. It's just <laughs> the guy's a bad person. She was right. He's a piece of garbage. End of story, right? And so, as a consequence, you can never learn from that that event because you can't examine what led up to that moment when that man abused that woman. It's simply men are bad, women are good. They levitate far, four feet above the ground, yeah. and any conversation about what led up to that that violent situation, we, we're not going to talk about it. Well, right? Let's ask Amber Heard about this, right? Right. Versus, yeah, let's not even go into the statistics on the fact that women abuse men more than men abuse women every year. It's just different. Kind of right. abuse, yeah. Well, they, they start, as Louis C.K., the comedian says, a man will hurt you physically. Like he'll rip your arm off and throw it in the ocean, whereas a woman will reach into your soul and leave you <laughs> empty and hollow inside. <laughs> or throw a bottle at your finger and or lose whatever. The tip of it. Yeah. The point is, to use Bill Burr's analogy, if we refuse to examine, like he said, if I got bit by a rattlesnake, wouldn't you want to know how it happened? Like, where were you at? Were you messing with the rattlesnake? Like, right. what were right. you doing? Right. Um, likewise, when there's a fire, firemen don't just put the fire out and drive away. They examine, like, what caused the fire? What was the catalyst? Where did it begin at? Oh, look, we have this oily rag over here, and it looks like someone shoved it in this, you know. If we don't examine the reasons for why this was written or said or happened, 
we completely ignore everything that we can learn from this to improve the present situation. So if you label something anti-Semitic off the bat, you completely refuse to acknowledge what led up to that term even being used for an entire group of people. And then in the present tense, why aren't we allowed to critique anyone with a Jewish last name? Right. And, right. and Luther, Luther clearly that, didn't understand himself right. as anti-Semitic. No, because right. the term didn't exist yet. Even as a concept. I mean, he obviously that's... religion. He was he, Again, this is the point, though. If you don't know the difference between Jewish people and Judaism... You, well, you have to make that you, distinction because the way this, I mean, literally yes. the scriptures say, you know, yeah. they were, they were hiding away for fear of the Jews, right? right? Not right. as a, it was a very specific term, the ones who crucified right. Jesus, right? Because <laughs> you know, the people who were hiding were also Jewish. <laughs> like they were hiding Ooh, from their what? own what? people. No, yeah. what? Oh, yeah. Can't Which is a great point though, to segue back into the text is in the enlightenment. Mm -hmm. and they in weren't the, allowed and, to critique it. They weren't allowed to critique it at all. The Protestants read the Gospels as a critique of Jews as a people, and thus you get the rise of anti-Semitism in the 1800s, for example. Sure, sure. And which led to what we know happened in the 20th century. But the well, point and is... And it didn't help that the banking system was already yes, predominantly right. run by... Jewish uh, families, right. Yeah, right. The point is, if you are never allowed to examine, well, Putin's bad because he invaded Russia because he's a demon. Really? Do we, are we going to go with the caricature cartoon explanation? that I was raised with in the 80s about the evil Russians and how they were going to nuke us. And now we're reliving this again and old timers like you and me who oh, lived through I the Cold War. I, yeah, I posted that in Telegram. It was an interesting conversation. Yeah. No last name, so I don't. Mm -hmm. we don't know who he is. He's, he's a YouTube guy um, mm -hmm. that just kind of presents the Russian side of things. And mm -hmm. he's like, we, we, we try to watch American movies. We can't because mm -hmm. the Russians are always bad. There's never yes. like even yeah. like a moderately yeah. like conflicted Russian. Right. <laughs> right. I, I watched Rocky 3 and 4. I know where this goes. Yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. And we grew up in the I 80s. watched Hunt for Red October, though. 100%. And yeah. now that that's an exception. It's yeah, an exception. But that was the 90s. Times have changed. Well, yeah, and it's also based on <laughs> mm -hmm. <this> reality. <laughs> yeah, it was actually based on a real story. Right. Um, the point is, though, in when we were growing up, we were never allowed to question the narrative, Russians are bad, Americans are good. Now we're never allowed to question the the. Oh, what was narrative. it? Red Dawn? Yeah, Red Dawn. Yeah, yeah. Russians are bad. America's good. When at a certain point you look at the skull on your helmet and go, are we the baddies? Yeah, are we the baddies. It's true. So the point of the whole conversation that we have on this podcast is asking the question, is Haman worth reading? Is he a bad guy? Is he a good guy? And do we really want to reduce everything to these cartoonish categories of white hats and black hats? Like you said, right. John of Damascus, when he writes on Islam, that's amazing to me. But then on other topics, I read them, I'm like, mm, I think you kind of missed Yeah, the mark. specifically on veneration of images. I'm That's just, a wild one. <laughs> yeah. I'm not, I'm not quite there. Yeah, exactly. But <clears throat> if you go east and have the conversation, you might have a totally different conversation with an eastern priest, yeah. a bishop, a primate, than you would in the west. Right. Because we have a history. Right. Well, and before we pushed record, we were talking about uh, this on the video, um, talking about Eugene Peterson. And I mentioned yeah. right, that he's a Presbyterian pastor. Mm -hmm. Well, we don't acknowledge, you know, that they have the office of the ministry the way that uh, the scripture gives it. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, well, that disqualifies him. Oh, and, and then he wrote this paraphrase and he calls it a translation. Well, yeah. that's not right. You can't do that. And, mm -hmm. you know, et cetera, et cetera. And you find ways to disqualify him rather yeah. than to say, yeah. um, you know, is there some, it, it, is he worth listening to? Mm -hmm. Can we still disagree at points? Right. Right. Are we, oh, if you read him, now you're declaring full pulpit and altar fellowship yeah. with him or something. Right. And like, what? What are you versus talking about? is he interesting to listen to? Right. I'll listen to a leftist as long as they're interesting. As mm -hmm. long as they're not boring and thoughtless and just, you know, ranting screeds that they picked up along the way from memos. Right. I'll listen to you if you're a leftist, even if I disagree with you, because you have something interesting to say. This is why I stopped listening to, I mean, most of those, um, the, the more left-leaning of the intellectual dark web. They just... Yeah. They got so dogmatic, mm -hmm. yeah. right? Where they they stopped thinking critically, and they just it's like, well, Trump is bad. You're like, yeah. okay. In in many respects, I agree personally, yeah. sure, you know, ethically, whatever, morally, yeah, morally, right, right. Um, but to to disqualify him wholly, it's like that. Mm -hmm. The same people are defending uh, Biden, who's mm -hmm. clearly as morally and ethically compromised, if not mm -hmm. more. You know, certainly mm -hmm. in in business dealings, more. Mm -hmm. um, it seems the evidence is still out, I suppose, on that. But it's really not. 
No, and it, you just look at it and like, what what is wrong with you? Why can't you mm -hmm. be? Um, I like to I like to describe myself as hypercritical. He says metacritical yeah. here, just hypercritical. Mm -hmm. It's like, yeah. wait, no, wait, I'm not going to assume anything I'm hearing is true, right or mm -hmm. good. Um, I it has to be refer to that as cynicism when I say it, but yes, go ahead. <laughs> well, no, it can lead to cynicism. Yeah. It can lead to cynicism where you're just like, well, every, everything's wrong, everything's you know broken, mm -hmm. <laughs> just burn it all down. <laughs> you know? uh, which there's that's no way to go through life either. Right. No. Nope. But but like like we said, is there? Any, well, you said you you probably let your guard down, you know, for Paul for Steve Paulson, mm -hmm. right? Um, and we probably do that for the most part with Luther, I would mm -hmm. say too. But there's the, for most most people, it's like no, we're not going to just take you at your word. Right. Mm -hmm. no, we're going to examine that, and it's not that Which, we don't trust you. It's it's our trust is limited, you know. To but the, again, notice that's the hermeneutics of suspicion about the Enlightenment. Correct. Why? Yeah, because the Enlightenment up. produced what? It formulated a faith in human reason and dominance in all areas of life, which Nietzsche warned us about. And now, 150 years later, he literally says 150 years later, this is what postmodernity is going to lead to. And you and I are going, oh, yeah, he was right. Uh huh. Yep. Right. But think about, uh, we were talking about COVID, and then masking has is, is mm -hmm. exacerbated this, yeah. is that now the, the people just don't trust each other. Right. Exactly. Like they don't even want to go out. Right. Right. Um, but I said, look, that's no way to go through life. If you yeah. can't trust people, like you can't drive on the road. Right. Because yeah. you have to trust not only institutions, but just people, generally speaking, that they but know what they're doing. Point, which is why people, consumer watchdog groups and lobbyists are demanding that our cars become smarter and smarter and smarter so that they drive themselves because we don't. We don't trust each other on the roads, which is why we need a self-driving car that communicates with other self-driving cars so we don't. We're completely removed from the responsibility of caring for our neighbor on the roads. Yeah. Well, I mean, there are guards and checks for suspicion that can. Sure. I, I mean, if you yeah. if you actually address it and mm -hmm. you say, "Look, we're we're going to have high standards. We're going to maintain those standards." Right. That that can actually abate the suspicion right. to a high degree enough that you can actually just go through life and mm -hmm. not be worried all the time. To your point, I'm, the other day, this question was brought up by a uh, person who attends a Lutheran church uh, of our church body. Do I have any experience raising cats from the dead? <laughs> now, if I did not have a hermeneutic of suspicion to begin with, I would try and answer that question <laughs> instead of letting God's word simply speak for itself. <laughs> because I've never been asked that question before. <laughs> and my, my, my state It just presumes is, that... Yeah. Somebody has actually said that they can raise their cat from the dead. Apparently, yes. There's been a conversation. I wasn't a part of it, <laughs> but I was then dragged into it. Do I personally have any experience raising cats from the dead? Of course, I immediately go to Stephen King because when I was growing up, I watched Pet Cemetery. <laughs> Pet Cemetery, right. And I'm like, you uh, don't want this at all because I know where this leads. And That's called necromancy and it's not pretty. Exactly. So... Yes, you should have a hermeneutic suspicion, especially about the Enlightenment and postmodernity and our blind trust in our ability to think our way through out anything. Out of every problem. Well, I was going to mention every problem. that. We, I mean, you have a very vivid illustration of this with uh, the conversation about um, about inflation. Mm -hmm. And you're like, you don't know what you're doing. Because mm -hmm. if I mean, obviously blaming Putin was just a talking point. Yeah. Because nobody could actually believe that. Because the timeline doesn't even work out. No. Right? We say, this is a very complicated system. We've been talking about this with supply chains too, which is related. It's like, you don't understand that if you change one thing, you break the whole system. Right. Right? And and how the market like develops into this. Mm -hmm. And then if you go and disrupt it, what kind of you know damage? It's right. Like, are you really that naive to think that, what was, what was uh, the president's or uh, selected president's answer to this oh we're going to grow our way out of out of yeah. this inflation yep. I'm like that's not how you can't that's not how it works yeah and and never mind we did income tax you can work your way out of the situation well and never mind it didn't work i mean the last quarter mm -hmm. right uh, yeah. gdp decreased for yeah. the first time in like 20 years oh, yeah oops mm -hmm. so so things are getting more expensive and yet our gross domestic product is decreasing right. hmm so mm. I guess to your point, to make we sure... Predicted, that some people predicted right. this a year ago because the signs yeah. were there and you saw the right. policies were terrible. But to keep it theologically grounded, yeah, what Haman's driving at is a critique of the future yep. in the present tense. We are now in that future critiquing it and saying, Again. 
Yeah. He was right. And here are the consequences. So when Haman's walking into church or lecturing or whatever it might be in a church, for example, he's saying to his people who are coming out of the culture, listen, I know people like Kant and Hegel are influential and right. their thoughts are finding their way into your churches through the pastors that they're training. And that's why they preach and teach the way they do. Again, go read The Hammer of God, chapter sure. two. I think it's the second section. That's really when he nails it. I think that's the part of it. Um, the second vignette. Yeah, the second vignette, because I think the third one deals with romanticism, which is a kind of reaction against mm, That's right. That. So it would be the second vignette. Yeah. yeah. But we now are reacting to our people who are coming out of the culture in our churches who are so saturated by the thing that Haman was warning against that now when we talk about inflation GDP, we talk about institutions and the division in our culture, we are now having to confront in our preaching and teaching the very things that Haman warned against. And now we have to say with to that fruit to the fruit of that tree, you're right. not allowed to come in here and rot in our congregations. And so we need to address this not merely in the moment, which then traps us in the moment, along right. with everybody else, but rather say, no, we were warned, so we need now to go back and listen to those voices from the past who warned us because they also w told us how to escape. Right, right. Yeah, and they saw it coming. I mean, that that's prophetic. Mm -hmm. So we, I mean, so we've talked about, I mean, pre I use, used to mock the preppers. Um, but mm -hmm. in a way, I think I mean, sometimes they were just driven by fear and sometimes mm -hmm. they were driven by, they just, you know, they saw yeah. what was coming, right. you know? And, and there's nothing wrong with being prepared for a no. future that might be, even right. if it might not be, that's okay. In Minnesota in the winter, sometimes it rains and snows, power lines get frozen and they snap. Right, right, And right. you could be without power for a day, even today. And yeah. so why not have a generator ready to go in case that happens? Right. Well, you're right. just worried about, you know, they're going to take, the Russians are going to take the grid out. No, I'm not worried about the Russians taking the grid out. I'm worried about snow and rain causing power lines to go down because it's well, happening before. And it, I mean, the, the key here is like, if you have the luxury to do that, yeah. if you don't, you might have to depend on others who do. Right. But even then, you build know. Build your community then, man. That's exactly right. In the church. Yeah. Build it yeah. in the church. Yeah. So, so, so I think what Kleinig's saying is that, you know, Haman saw. Yeah. And he saw in a way that nobody appreciated pretty much at his, yeah. in his time. But now, you know, 200 years later, we look and like, oh, he saw that the alignment was going to lead yeah. down to, the to modernism, to postmodernization. To yeah. basic, you know, everyone living according to the passions, desires of their flesh, right? Yeah. Equity, equity, equity. Everyone's mm -hmm. the same. So, Ugh. contemporary interest in Haman focuses on him as a critic of the Enlightenment with its rationalism, its promotion of individual autonomy, which is the atomization of the society, which then led to the atomization of the churches. So, broadly speaking, scholars paid attention to four main topics of Haman's writings. The correlation of language and thought, the nature of people as embodied beings with integrated physical, mental, and spiritual powers, the role of the senses and the perspective imagination or perceptive imagination in all human knowledge, and God's self-revelation as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, excuse me, <coughs> by condescension in creation, redemption, and the inspiration of sacred scripture. The key to his thinking on these topics and all his other concerns is provided by his London writings. For all the issues that he later pursues less directly and more enigmatically in his literary work are already expressed embryonically and explicitly in the London writings. They show us the whole man with his whole vision of human life with God in its cosmic context. Huh. The growing interest in Haman's criticism of the Enlightenment has led to an increased appreciation of his London writings for their articulation of foundations for his life and thought as a man of letters, like the Confessions of Augustine. They are not just of value historically, but also existentially for orientation in our so-called postmodern context. Thus, the Lutheran theologian Oswald Bayer and Bert Weissenborn quite rightly claim, quote, the London writings are a religious, cultural, literary, historical, philosophical, and theological source that is first class in its significance. Since up to now, we've had no complete translation of these writings in English, this publication serves to fill that gap. I think this is still really important, and we've emphasized it in a number of ways, right? But his his understanding, philosophical, literary yeah. these these things that he that he writes on later in ways mm -hmm. that, like I said, um, I think it's they're dense. They're, they're dense. Yeah, well, it's very German, right? But um, it comes out of just reading the scripture, mm -hmm. 
So I was discussing this. I don't think I posted this in Telegram. Um, but another Barna study came out. Those are sometimes, they're just generally depressing at this point. Mm. But, um, it was a study of American parents of preteen children. Sure. And found that uh, of among, among American parents, 2% held, uh, you know, according to Barna's definition, an Orthodox worldview, Christian mm-hmm. worldview. Um, f- even though 67% of those parents claimed to be Christian. Right. But they only 2% held, uh, especially on, on um, moral issues, like mm-hmm. a consistent worldview uh, with yeah. scripture. Uh, then, but also interestingly, of those who were uh, claimed to be, oh, that regularly attend, re- regularly read the Bible. So at least once mm-hmm. a week, read the Bible. So that was only like 20% of those surveyed. Yeah. Only 4% of them held a consistently mm-hmm. biblical worldview, yeah. right? Understand the world according to the scriptures. Yeah. Uh, and I think it's kind of profound when you start well, to yeah. think about it. It's like, oh no, so I've been how... attacked by Christians the last several months for saying things that are in the scriptures. Right, as, right, right. Just being absolutely like, you believe in fairy tales. So, what part of the Bibles are you reading? I think right. that's one of the questions. Mm-hmm. I mean, are you are you avoiding sections that are a little bit more challenging? Um, well, they're perhaps. not in the lectionary. Notice. Yeah, that's true. Most uh, well, most, most sections are not even in the lectionary. Yeah. So they're not actually being directed to read things that maybe they wouldn't normally. Mm-hmm. I think that's helpful. Uh, sure. Discipline, you know, for discipline. Or we just ignore the text. Right, but there's whole sections that, that we've remarked the lectionary mm-hmm. avoids as well. Yeah. That don't get read in public. I did that for my Lenten series. We yeah. read the Psalms that aren't in the hymnal. Right. Uh, specifically the ones on lament, yeah. right, where you complain to God. And like, we're not mm-hmm. allowed to complain in church. I'm like, well, right. here, we're going to do it. <laughs> yeah. Right, and we're going to see how the Psalms... Psalms as we did. That would You're be not the allowed other way to ask to go. God to kill your enemies. <laughs> right, exactly. In church. So you, can, you can go that so route, too. So we're gonna. Right, right. And so I think at least what uh, Klein is suggesting here is that Haman, mm-hmm. you know, he... Later it's less explicit, but here it's explicit. I'm reading the Bible, here's my thought. Yeah. And then yeah. that thought carries through. Yeah. We've talked about this with Luther, too. Mm-hmm. Right? I mean, you can read... If you read the earth, like 15... 19, well, we'll say 1520, 21, yeah. through, through the catechisms... Mm-hmm. There's you almost see nothing new after that. Yeah, you just see it expressed in new and more creative right. ways. Yeah, from the text, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so like the mature Luther and the young Luther, they're not really all that different. I, mm-hmm. I you know, we we've disagreed. He doesn't really seem to change. It's just yeah. he grows well, in think, the way in his yeah, expression. Fifteen twenty one through the Peasants' Revolt, his mind is exploding with right. scripture. Right. It. He's like a child with a toy. Like he's just <laughs> so overjoyed at this, this toy that he's been hoping for. He can't stop playing with it. He can't stop talking about it. But right. then as he hits the Peasants' Revolt and then into Augsburg, now all of a sudden, he's, you know, he spent a decade translating and editing the Old Testament. He knows it. So now yeah. it, comes, it just becomes, like you said, grinding it down, becoming more efficient in, in how he expresses it. Right. But simultaneously, he's getting older. Right. But one of the things that I think is interesting with Luther, and, and I imagine it, what, or at least what Klein is suggesting mm-hmm. here in his study of the of the scripture, you know that English Bible in London. Yeah. Um, what happens with Luther is particularly you see, you see him um, not necessarily quote, but express things in the terms of the of the psalmody, which mm-hmm. he had learned by heart as a monastic, yeah. you know, as an Augustinian monk. Yeah. So, but those get reframed or reconfigured, you know, to be a, for faith in Christ rather yeah. than just discipline, you know, right. in a, in a, you know, for personal life or mm-hmm. just as a monk. Right, and that and that that seems to be that thing that he read, and then you know the light bulb moment or whatever you want to put mm-hmm. it, the enlightenment of the spirit. You know, then then those psalms seem to re- his understanding of the psalms, and he doesn't really do much with it, you know, explicitly. You have the you have the those early psalm commentary, yeah. which is a mess, and then he does a little bit more later, but he never. It's too bad he doesn't actually go back, like you know, mm-hmm. while he's doing the Genesis lectures and does, right. do, do a full psalm commentary. Because, but it seems to be pervasive in his writings. Is my point? Mm-hmm. It, yeah. It's like the, it's like the Ur text, right? Yeah. For Luther, yeah. you know, is that is right. that those 150 Psalms that he learned by heart? Yeah, he lectures on them early on because he's assigned to lecture on them because you know. Yeah, them. that's true. Yeah. But then when you get Psalm 118, which he wrote while he was at um, the castle. Oh, right, he, that's right. I pointed yeah. that out to you. Yeah, yeah. Psalm 118 was a letter he wrote. Mm-hmm. That's a the letter. Commentary. Yeah, yeah, it's called and, a commentary because of the humanist influence in Lincoln, one. It's so long; <laughs> it's so long. You're like, this is a letter. It's like, yeah, I had time. <laughs> yeah, but that's genius. That work is genius. His beautiful confantimony, as he calls it. So is let's that, go through this yeah. then to wrap. Yeah. yeah, it's called the confantimony. 
um, my psalm, he calls it, which is why I have it tattooed on my arm, because it's also my family psalm. But yeah, there's a, it's the same thrust. It's just that in 1513 to 15, when he comments on Psalm 118, he does it as an academic, as a monk still, fresh mm -hmm. out of his studies. Right. And he plays with the Hebrew, but he's still under the influence of the late medieval system of exegesis and commentary. By 1531, when he writes that letter on Psalm 118, he's just, yeah, he's, he's himself. He knows who he is as a man. He's a husband and father. He's suffered some deaths. He's been through some really heavy stuff. And he's a fully matured theologian at that point. Right. And he expects to die any moment, which is a constant theme in the 1530s. And so there's a certain edge to everything he wrote during that point. Yeah. Um, and I think, again, like I said earlier, with Haman, here's a man who, he's not important. He's not a member of the guild. He's not institutional. He's suffering. And, and so he's saved from that. And in that salvation, he realizes, oh, okay, everybody and everything let me down that I counted on. And all that was left was God's word, and it saved me. So let's. And, and he's kind of just like, you know, that philosophy professor at the University right. of North Dakota or something mm -hmm. who just keeps writing to mm -hmm. the important people. Yeah. And they just kind of file his writings. Away. Right. <laughs> like, oh, right. yeah. But he publishes it, on a, publishes it on a blog right. or something, right? What does Paul say? I went away for a little bit because <laughs> I had to work some things out. But in Paul's letters, you can see that he's in love with the scriptures. Yeah, yeah, fully. But what changed? Jesus. Now all of a sudden when he reads the scriptures, he's like, oh, it's all about Jesus. I didn't know that before my eyes were opened. And now that I see Jesus on every page of scripture, I got I to gotta tell people about this. I, I made that remark uh, talking about the road to Emmaus this week, right? Mm -hmm. And that, you know, it's how amazing, or somebody actually made the comment, I think, that, you know, how amazing it would be to have their eyes opened, you know, at the breaking of the bread. Yeah. And then to remember all the things he taught them on the road while they were mm -hmm. walking, I'm like, yeah, I mean, that would have been impressive and, and pretty, right. you know, mind-blowing, right? Mm -hmm. how, how Jesus, again, reconfigures their whole understanding of the scripture. But uh, but then I said, but imagine what it would have been like for Paul, you know, <laughs> who was, he wasn't, he wasn't just like a, a lay Jew. I mean, he's, right. a, he's the persecutor of the church. Yeah. You know? Right. Uh, and to have that completely reversed, right? Exactly. Undercut. Right, like, and yeah. then and then to take joy, and I mean, obviously you you know recognize your salvation now, you know to have the joy of of that. I mean, and you mm -hmm. see that a little bit in Luther too, right? Because he's living under the law, and then yeah. he discovers you know is discovered yes. by the gospel. Yeah, yeah. So contemporary, I want to focus on this paragraph at the end of the the episode here, so we can kind of because there's mm -hmm. a lot. But contemporary interest in Haman focuses on him as a critic of the Enlightenment, bonus, with its rationalism and its promotion of individual autonomy. Good for you. Broadly speaking, then, scholars paid attention to four main topics of Haman's writings. One, the correlation of language and thought, right? That these are not... So what the Enlightenment does is it that words represent things, which is a very platonic thing to, to teach, mm -hmm. but that words don't define reality. Our minds do. And our words are simply an expression of how our subjective mind... Because remember, the Enlightenment is the attack on objective reality. This is why we are where we you are. You say today. remember, but I don't think people knew that or believed it, even at the time. Sure. But it's a sense of like m the way that I think, I think therefore I am, Descartes. Mm -hmm. Our thinking, our reason defines reality. It is what is real. Our subjective experience of reality makes reality real. And our words, it, they represent things, but words don't define reality. Versus in, like we talked about at the or they, beginning. Or of, they aren't even attached to it, like reality. Right. Well, they're just air. They're just air, right? So when we talk about the psychology of God, for example, in the present tense, when we talk about the psychology of God, we're actually recommitting the original sin of <laughs> divinization. Like, what is God actually thinking? Well, for the Hebrew, for the Israelite, what God says is reality. Words right. define reality. For the Enlightenment, it's the opposite. Right, and I was going to say the that. the way that I read it. But when you're talking about, oh, uh, well, like, what is a woman, right? Well, I can't right. tell you that. I'm not a biologist. I mean, that mm -hmm. was famous kind of thing yeah. from future Supreme meme. Court justice. Yeah. yeah, it's a meme. Um, but you can see how that's a reversal of what mm -hmm. God actually gave Adam to do in the garden, which was Correct. to name the creatures. Right. Attach the name to it. It doesn't mean the name might not change later on, and that instead of calling it a behemoth, you call it a... Um, whale? What? Whale. Yeah, or Leviathan, and you end yeah. up calling it, yeah. All right, so fine, we have new names. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the point is, is that things do have names, 
Right. That reality is describable. We call a thing what it is. We look yeah. at it and we say, that's a tree. Yeah. Right. And it's commonly understood. Yeah. You know, people right. look at it and say, that's a tree. Now, what kind of tree is it? I don't know. Right. We have other names for well, that. Now we get into Plato because Plato said that every tree has an essence, that, right? An essence yeah. that defines its quote unquote treeness. So that when I point at a tree instead of a bush, or I point at a bush and call it a tree, you're like, but that's not a tree because a tree has treeness. Okay, so is, so is a tomato a vegetable or a fruit? Right, it's a fruit, because it has <laughs> seeds. <laughs> Period, it's easy. <laughs> I'm like, nope, it's a vegetable, because we call it a vegetable. And there right, you go, subjectivity. Right. That's a great example, by the way. It's a great I know, example. I love that one. I love that one. Because well, Plato you look would at argue it. a tomato has tomato-ness, and therefore- But see, I'm looking out here, and, and I know Plato would say that's not, that's not fully a tree. Yeah. And that one isn't either, and that one isn't either, because it has these that's deformities. Because he was all about potentiality and actuality. Oh, that's Aristotle. Okay, fine. Well, but in any case, you look at it like, no, mm -hmm. those are all trees. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're trees. They're clearly trees. That word right. applies to that reality. Yeah. 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 <laughs> but what gives it, it's what allows you to look out the window and go, that's a tree. So, so the point with the, you know, the direction of the enlightenment, and we certainly yes. see it now in, in, in mm -hmm. postmodern. Everything is subjective. Everything is your experience. I disagree. I think everything is subjective that we want to be subjective. No, I'm saying that's the Enlightenment project. I'm so, I don't believe that, but I'm saying the Enlightenment is saying words don't mean anything. No, I, I, I don't think people actually still believe that. I think they, they believe that only when they want to, right? Yeah. So they, they look at themselves and say, I want to be something different. I want to be a furry mm, creature, okay. yeah. right? We have yeah, litter yeah. boxes in the classrooms here, right. you know, at random, like mm -hmm. school of all, mm -hmm. you know, rural Wisconsin and you've got litter boxes in the classroom. Yeah. I mean, it's crazy. Yeah. The infectious infectivity yeah. of bad ideas, right? Idea right. pathogens, as uh, right. as they're called sometimes, right? But you look at it and like, yeah. Except if there's a if there's a you know car coming down the road, mm -hmm. and I say to you, there's a car coming down the road. Don't step into the road, right? Unless well, you could be an idiot or you could be a child, but you know you're not going to step out in front of the car, right? Are you going to say no? That's your subjective experience of this. I don't actually think that's a car coming down the road, mm -hmm. right? I think I can step. I think it's a it'll. Pillow. Yeah, it's a pillow and it's just going to hit me. Yeah. And it's going to bounce off of me. You're like, well, do you actually honestly that. believe that? Yeah, well, it may, in, it may end up in your, right. to your death. Which, by the way, is why you and I have really gotten into Carl Jung because he deals with this in his psychology of like, yeah, that's called neuroses. Mm. <laughs> it's a person's flight from reality. No. It's them not, it's them choosing to willfully deny objective reality, which then creates this divide within a person's mind between what is true, what is <laughs> observably true, and what they demand to be true. And that's what creates, well, ultimately two psychoses. I just the thought point, of a perfect, perfect example. Yeah. Uh, the captchas, you know, where you have to click, like, click the pictures of the bicycles. Yeah, yeah, right. right. Like, yeah. we shouldn't, if, if we were truly postmoderns, we couldn't do that. Right. Because you call that a bicycle, I call that a motorcycle. Like, right. No, 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 they're bicycles. Yeah. And it won't let you move on until you actually agree. Yes. Those are bicycles. Yes. Those are crosswalks. Right. Right, or whatever it is. Those yeah. are street signs. Yeah. So we still, I mean, the idea that there's no objective reality. Right. Eh, I Again, think we subjectively we, we, yeah. apply that where we yes, want to. Yes, of course we do. So yeah. that's the number one thing. Does language define thought or does thought define language? For the, yes. the Descartians, the Cartesians, I think... Therefore, I am. Whereas for a Christian, we would go, God speaks, therefore, I am. The word defines the thing. Yeah. Exactly. So that's the number one attack on Christianity, then, like we talked about with words. Yep. Words have power. God's word has power. Yours has potentiality. Where they're like, nope, my words have power. God's, God's words have potentiality. So, second of all, the nature of people as embodied beings, embodied meaning flesh and blood, not just spirits carrying around some meat sack, with integrated, and this is key physical, mental, and spiritual powers. So I talk about this all the time, and this is why people get, you know, even my own members are like, oh, here we go again. Yep. We are not three individuated parts that make up a person, and then when we die, those three things go in different directions. That's, that's post-modernity in a nutshell. No. According to the Hebrew, body, spirit, and mind, or body, soul, and heart, body, soul, and mind, sorry, there we go, actually make you you, that you are a tripartite being that is a reflection of the Trinity, just and as that, the temple is a reflection of the Trinity, just as the creation itself is a reflection of the Trinity. Right, and the Greeks describe you in, with different terms and yeah. kind of different understanding, but it's seeking to do the same thing. Yeah. It's to just describe um, from different perspectives, mm -hmm. you. <laughs> yeah, but you, you are one whole person made up of three parts. 
And yet here we go, always. It's like, well, my soul is separate yes. from my body, especially right. in Easter time with resurrection yeah. stuff. Mm -hmm. Like, no. Jesus appears and he's like, I'm not a ghost. I'm not a spirit. Right. Look, touch it. You know, right. give me a yeah. hug. Yeah. <laughs> That's how I translated it. Touch my He, yeah, he says, handle hug. me. Uh, yeah. And like, yeah, he says, give me a hug. Give me a hug. <laughs> Look. Come on, hug it up, hug it up. Uh, oh, do you have any food? Of... I'm going to yeah. eat. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> That's like, what kind of resurrection would it be if, if I'm just yeah, a we didn't eat. spirit? I, had, I Which, do have an empty stomach because I did actually die. It is kind of interesting, though, that they assume that that happens on multiple occasions that he's just a spirit. Yeah. Like, so do they see apparitions that they they at least mm -hmm. believe in the potentiality of a, yeah. <laughs> of well, a Paul spirit? Paul assumes it. Yeah. Paul assumes there's evil spirits. The Old Testament, Saul was possessed by a spirit that gave him uh, oh, migraines. Yeah. yeah, that's right. God allowed a spirit to what is it afflict soul right but that's not jesus jesus is flesh and blood but jesus is flesh Spirit, and blood so soul, that's number two the enlightenment thing. attempts to set, go back to the old greek way of seeing things now and Haman says no no that's not christian the role of the senses and the perceptive imagination in all human nature human knowledge sorry all human knowledge is what sensory and it's perception experiential it's all experiential Therefore, we cannot trust human knowledge to define God, sin, free will, the church, the sacraments, God's word, preaching, sanctification, anything. Because why? Well, we talked about it. You and I will talk. We're just sharing our opinion. We're having fun. We're going wherever the conversation takes us. Mm -hmm. And then people will say, no, I disagree with you. That's not how I see these. This is not how, why I think about this. Therefore, you're wrong. Okay. Okay. From a human perspective, yeah, uh, yeah we see things 100%. differently. Exactly. Well, I, Versus, I discuss mm -hmm. I discuss this in the post resurrection accounts, right? You have four evangelists. Mm -hmm. They they have different experience. They perceive right. different things. They even right. even on the same night, Easter Sunday night, right? right. So Monday, actually, right. if you're Hebrew, um, yeah, there you, go. you know, they 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 record different things happening. Did they all happen? I would say yes, um, but they have different. They have they saw things different. They believe, right. remember different things. Right, right. It, so and 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 collectively, then there's mm -hmm. a body of knowledge about the resurrection right. of Jesus, right? right, and his appearances afterwards. But to your point, pre-modern knowledge is a communal event. It's a communal phenomenon. Oh yeah, what did you hear? What did you hear? What did you hear? Oh, and that's... then you put it together. Yeah, the whole community partakes in this, though. In postmodernity, in mo in the Enlightenment, it's all about the individual's experience. There has to be one, and or there has to be one universal truth. Right. And we have to harmonize all the experiences. There's your equity, though. There's the push for equity, which comes yeah. out of humanism. So love an example is this. Yeah, yeah. Love your neighbor as yourself means love whoever is right in front of you in a body. That's your neighbor, who's ever right in front of you. Humanism yeah. said we have to love people, and they meant everybody. You have to love everybody the same, because, again, equity. So... Again, another assault on God's word. Love your neighbor as yeah, yourself. Yeah, we don't even believe that because we'll we'll no, arm we don't. we'll arm the Ukrainians and we'll bomb the others. But the point like... is, if I love people, <laughs> I don't have to take responsibility for the person right in front of me. Mm. I can send food to Ethiopian children who are starving to death, and then completely ignore my neighbor who lives in abject poverty across the street from me, who I've never even talked to. Right, but that's not as impressive. Right, to me, as an right. individual, it doesn't give me a sense of satisfaction. But again, this is what Haman's critiquing. He's warning about this. <laughs> That's because you don't know the child in, in Ethiopia. Because if Correct. you if you actually met them, you might not right. like them. But your neighbor who you don't like, who needs right. your help, yeah. <laughs> you're going to have to deal with them over and over exactly. and over. Exactly. And, and they probably never change. And yep. so <laughs> it'll be the same terrible experience every time. Exactly. Yeah. And yet that's what love is. And lastly, God's self revelation. We don't reveal God. God reveals himself to us. As Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, by condescension, He comes to us. We don't climb mm -hmm. up to Him. Right. He does this in the creation. He does this in the redemption of Jesus Christ, and He does this in the inspiration of sacred scriptures, which comes from the Holy Spirit. Yeah, and we talked about everything we, is outside of us, right. coming to us. Was this when we recorded? Or was it was before we recorded today. I don't remember. We we're talking about um, you know God speaks to us in terms that we can understand. He tells us what we no, need we're talking to about know. this before we recorded. I think. Yeah. Or maybe yeah. at the front end, but and that's that condescension. It's like mm -hmm. it doesn't mean that we're idiots, but of course we are, uh, relatively speaking. <laughs> um, well, but the he does. Do from Nagel is how could you explain to a grasshopper what it's like to be a man? You'd have to become a grasshopper, 
because you'd have to be able to speak in a grasshopper's language and using their analogies and their um, images and, and colloquialisms. Right. And even then, you're trying to describe something to a grasshopper that's incomprehensible to a grasshopper because you're not a grasshopper, you're a man. So mm. likewise, when God condescends to us in the form of a man <clears throat> in the flesh and tells us what God is like, he always uses analogies and parables. Yeah. The kingdom um, of God is like. Right. And then, but then I, I think of like John's uh, purpose statements uh, mm -hmm. in his gospel, right? Yeah. Uh, these things are written that you may believe yes. very specifically this mm -hmm. Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the Savior, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, the Son of the living God, and that by believing in him, you would have life in his name. Yeah. Okay. Now, everything else that it might do or, or give you yeah. is good, right? Right. Or, you know, but that's the purpose, yeah. right? And, and I could have written a lot of other things. Right. <laughs> and by the way, over 500 people in and around Jerusalem saw him. Hmm? Yeah, that's And Peter, interacted or, with him. Paul. That's Paul, right? First Corinthians. Is that Paul? Yeah, that's in First Corinthians. Mm, that was appeared John. to over 500. Yeah, it's yeah over that's 500 in, people. Yeah, okay. that's it. It's, it's, in a, it's a weird reference. It's off somewhere. Well, Paul makes weird references. So well, Paul has I, experience. I, knew a man I mean, was Paul has. In the seventh heaven. <laughs> I mean, he was running the the uh, the let's find the Christians. Um, yeah, right. Um, Gestapo, I guess. Right, exactly. Oh no, I said a keyword. That'll get us banned. Oh uh, man. Right, right. But any so well, <laughs> he's running it. So he he would know if there were five hundred that saw him because he was right. interrogating them and and then putting exactly. imprisoning them. <laughs> Excuse me, have you seen Jesus? Yeah, haven't you? No, I just checking to see if you have. <laughs> All right, send him off. All you right. know anybody else who's seen Jesus? I want to talk to them too. But notice what he's doing. He's being a good journalist a good investigative journalist, a good detective. Yeah. Well, you get that with Paul. I mean, he's probably the most apologetic of the bunch. Maybe yeah. John, but definitely Paul. Because it's right. like, uh, I didn't believe this, and mm -hmm. I need to believe this now. Right. right. Well, and he's talking to Gentiles, mm. completely out of the loop of Scripture and the history of Israel, for the most part. Yeah. So, I mean, actually, the, the analogy of Paul to Haman here, mm -hmm. at least as Kleiner describes yeah. him, is, is helpful because... I think so, uh, yeah. Paul's kind of that... He's kind of that bridge character, right? Where yeah. he's, he knows Greek philosophy. Um, he, knows the, you know, he knows the pagans. But he Which, also... by the he, way, what came a, out of the Enlightenment, Paul invented the Christian religion. Hmm. Yeah. That came out of the Enlightenment, too. Yeah. I was just thinking, though, that, I mean, Paul has In that fact, bridge... In fact, there's a famous book. It's called The Faith of Jesus and the Religion of Paul. You know that one? <sighs> that can, no, I don't. Yeah, let me look. I know the new talk. perspective on Paul crowd, which is more recent, last fifty years. But no, I'll look it up while you talk. No, I was just saying that Paul and uh, you know bridges that that um, confession between. I thought it was Schweitzer, but I could be wrong. Oh, it could be no. Schweitzer was definitely a new perspective crowd. I don't even know if he was really a Christian, but that's another story. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so he so Paul does both. Right, and so Haman yeah. is like, I'm a faithful Christian, but I'm also interacting with the philosophy of the day, and I'm going to provide that critique, you know, and in these four areas, which are really helpful, uh, four main topics. Mm -hmm. So now, now, like, how much more can we read? Adolf right? Diesman. Diesman. Hmm. It's called the Religion of Jesus and the Faith of Paul. That's Diesman, though. I thought Schweitzer wrote something. Ah, I don't know. Anyways, no, it's been around since the Enlightenment, though, with Spinoza. Um, Bauer, Ritual. Well, because they operated from that principle, or, yeah. that, or that that idea that mm -hmm. um, you know this is a this is myth telling, and it's yeah. and it's editorialized. Well, remember, there's a famous uh, essay called "Religion to Its Culture Despisers" that came mm -hmm. out of the Enlightenment. That's Schleiermacher, I believe. Mm. Actually, I'm almost positive it's this is the problem when you know too much. On religion and its speeches to its cultural despisers by yeah Schleiermacher. It's out in my library in the Bible study room. No. It's it's a it's a hoot to read by the way. It's so much fun. <sighs> if you want to read it, you're not going to find Jesus, the sacraments, the efficacy of God's word. Anything we just read in this paragraph is not a Schleiermacher's critique of of uh, yeah his apology. It, it's not there. It's moralistic therapeutic deism. He's trying to sell Christianity as a reasonable rational, culturally acceptable religion. Right. There's nothing radical about what he says whatsoever because he doesn't want it to be radical. He wants it to be accepted. Oh, you mean it's exactly how the scriptures are approached today by most? Yes. 
Okay. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> oh, make no doubt about it. I mean, we are the children of Schleiermacher, Kant, and Hegel, for sure. Which is why someone like Hamann, who's so beneficial to us in the present tense, relatively undiscovered. Right. So I appreciate the effort here, and we're, we're going to have to dig into some of the his actual, like, here's, I'm reading the Bible and here's what it says. Yeah, we'll do that in the next uh, That's the series. key metaphors and themes. Key metaphors yeah. and themes. There we go, the archipelago. Mm-hmm. But, uh, yeah, it's a good place to stop because we're about so that's our, in. So that was our introduction, but it gives us a lot of context, right? Mm-hmm. I, I think which is helpful. Like, why read this guy? Well, because right. he's, in, he's in the context of, of uh, the beginnings of what we're experiencing now, and it's like full mm-hmm. fruit. Fruitedness. Right. Right. <laughs> fruitiness. fruitiness. That's even I better. Hope it's fruity. It's tutti fruitiness. It's fruity <laughs> it's pebbles. Completely, it's completely ripened. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm thinking and about it's... it too. At the and we're at the end, so only the people that actually listen to the podcast are still with us. Um, if I would like to hear from our listeners, write an email, send us a text. Do you want us to continue to engage with the culture and bring that into the theological conversation? Or do you want us to stick more to the texts and askew the current cultural conversation for the sake of the historical conversation? Because I'd like to know, just kind of broadly speaking, when you listen to our podcast, do you whether you agree or disagree, that's beside the point. Do you want theological conversation that does address the cultural context in which we live? So there's a point of reference. Or is it more like, just shut up and talk about Jesus? I like, I like Franz's point. Because I, because I think the answer is you can't talk about c- contemporary culture without talking about what preceded well, it. I think you and I are. I was told this. I've been told this since I became a Christian. I was told this in the missionary field that, um, and it's just been proven to be true because I keep going back to it. But when I read the prophets, I find that they are contemporaneous, very yeah. contemporaneous, yeah. and and have very biting critiques of their society and, and the culture. Yes, it is, Paul. Thank you. Telegram is a great way, and you we can join we on. have been posting a lot of the more absurd, you know, yeah, off the rail stuff there. Yeah, you know, thought engaging. I mean, I say yeah. absurd, but it could be just thought, you know, engaging. Just well, like I posted those three videos on ancient culture and Tartaria and and that kind of stuff. And mm, right, I did right, it on right. purpose because I wanted to see if the Telegram group, which claims to be you know free thinkers and open to different perspectives, do they? I wanted to see. Well, that's kind of how we are, and the people that join and are part of the Telegram group. I mean, we I don't think the bots are though. No, the bots aren't. So maybe it's the bots that are upset by me <laughs> posting the video. But I just posted it for the fact of like, oh, you're not even willing to think about these things because they violate the orthodoxy of what you were taught in your school, in your educational process. Yeah, but if you, you don't, don't have to bother to listen, how are you supposed to respond to it critically? Right. Or yeah, I don't believe this because it does. It's not in my textbooks that I read growing up, or this isn't on the History Channel that I watch. And likewise, then, with the podcast, the conversation that we are having is to challenge, I guess is the way to say it, well, mm-hmm. kind of what we read in, in the introduction here to Haman, which is to, to recognize that we're always in conflict with the culture of today, because the culture of today buys into the ideals and assumes the zeitgeist. And it's almost, no, it is always, not almost, it is always anti-Christ. Yeah. It is, because it is by nature, the world by nature is anti-Christ. We live in a fallen creation, we live in an evil world, and the prince of this world is Satan. And therefore, the Christian faith and the preachers that God sends are always going to be outliers. They're always going to be right out of sync with today, right? And this is why all the prophets were murdered by their contemporaries. Right, because if you if you if you're not like uh, if you're not like Haman and you're off in East, East Prussia, mm-hmm. but if you're actually like in Berlin, you're going to get run out, yeah, 100%. or worse. Right? How dare you critique one of the masters of the university, an institution within our system? How dare yeah. you critique Kant? Right? Don't you know how many seminarians he's graduated who have gone on to serve faithfully as pastors and churches? Hmm. You know. <laughs> yeah. So I'm just curious because again, without without you, the listener, giving us feedback, we don't know whether you're engaged with us in our. Con- well, I mean, we have metrics; we can see the metrics, and the the show continues to grow, and um, we're allowed to broadcast on the 1517 network. So something's happening there. But without your feedback, we don't know whether we're steering the conversation in a direction that is engaging you, or it's causing you to kind of just 
shut it off and, and go seek other things. And I'd just be curious. Um, yeah. Well, especially on this topic, I mean, mm -hmm. this, the, we, I mean, we struggled a little bit because I wanted to read a different thing and it was mm -hmm. just, it was just too yeah. dense. It was, I mean, I was having a hard time understanding what he was saying. Right. And it would require mm -hmm. so much, uh, you know, legwork to just mm -hmm. get up to speed. Whereas something like this is like the entry entree, I guess that's the right word yeah. or entry point, you know, right. because he's young for one thing. Um, mm -hmm. it's when he's first discovering the Bible. So it's, it's, you know, it's not going to have this, you know, the, the density of a, of a mature thought. Mm -hmm. Right. And, um, I still think it's, well, the point is, is that mm, he was sidelined, he was disqualified, he wasn't read, mm -hmm. and then he's been discovered, which then mm -hmm. begs the question, you know, why, right? Right. right. And that's, and that's, how, that's always been the premise of the show. It was like, yeah. why, why are these people, why aren't we supposed to read them? Or why are yeah. they being read now and they weren't? Yeah. You know, what, what happened here? Not necessarily explicitly banned, yeah. but you know, there's a shadow banning, right? So I was going to say, I think most of the theologians we read are shadow banned. They're kind of memory hold on purpose. Yeah, there you go. Like, and that's very upper Midwestern, very Scandinavian thing to do. We'll just ignore <laughs> them until they go away. And then we'll act as if they never lived, which is a very Jewish way of excommunicating someone from your community. Like the <laughs> man is. born blind and his parents. Yeah, like, yeah. Like, listen, if he healed, if this Jesus dude healed this guy, you're going to be stricken from the records. So what's your answer? And they're like, he's old enough to speak for himself. We're going home. And the man was literally thrown out of the community, not allowed to be spoken of again, simply because he happened to be blind and Jesus saw him. <laughs> like, like I didn't ask for any of this. Jesus just came up and like did yeah. the thing. Yeah. And we, and that resonates with us. You know, the people like, uh, we talked about, I think in the last episode, um, mm -hmm. Joseph of Arimathea and, and Nicodemus, who both are willing to both, you know, wreck their their right. uh, Passover purity, right, to handle the dead body of Jesus, really just wreck their status in the community yeah. entirely and just say, you know what, whatever, yeah. Jesus Jesus is it. This is where it's at. And I you think, know? too, because I was reflecting on this last week because we had the week off, is, again, that so many conversations that I listen to are so insular. And what I mean by that is we're allowed to talk about what happens in the church, both narrowly and broadly speaking, but we're not allowed to then a gate, you know, address, well, what happens when you walk out of the church and you're in your vocations in the society in which you live? And you are one of those 2% that read scripture and that is your worldview. And yet even other Christians who are contemporaneous to you are saying, you don't actually believe that, do you? Yeah. And you have to make a good confession. Like, yeah, actually I do believe that. And then they treat you like you're a nut or right. you're old fashioned or you're out of sync. You're out of step with, with today because everybody else at my church thinks the same way I do, so why would you think that? Right. And my pastor preaches this way, so why, you know? And at least in my opinion, because again, I, I'll never not be a former atheist. So therefore, when mm -hmm. I engage in that conversation, that little atheist in me is always saying, okay, but you have nothing to say to me. You have mm -hmm. no apology to make for your faith to me because your conversation is so insular, so inside baseball that only other Christians could possibly understand what you're talking about. And mm. to go back to Schleiermacher's title, you know, Essays to the Culture Despisers, the culture kind of despises Christianity <laughs> nowadays. And, right, and rightly so. And, and rightly so. And they're openly hostile toward us. Right. They're not putting us in jail or executing us in the street yet, but they're still hostile towards the Christian. I mean, the New York Times on Easter weekend, as they do, argued, we got to get rid of God. We just got to stop talking about God because it's not useful. It doesn't help push society forward. It doesn't address, and this is the key point of this, this editorial, talking about God and believing in God doesn't actually help with the Ukraine situation or the inflation or the division in our country. Hmm. And it I could. read that, I was like, hmm. <laughs> or. <laughs> or you're just not letting it. Like I said, when people come to me and say that the angels in the scriptures are actually aliens, <laughs> I always just reverse and go, or maybe you yeah. haven't thought about it in the other direction that the aliens to which you refer are messengers from God. Right. Yeah. Uh, I would, I would say, you know, in my experience anyway, mm -hmm. is that almost nobody in our congregations lives a purely insular life where it's, no, it's just, they're just praying the scriptures. Yeah. I mean, we're, and we don't we're not, even, yeah, we don't live in a monastery. No. No, and so the idea that you you aren't going to interact with the world. Mm -hmm. I mean, you you can try to flee the world, like live the hermetic lifestyle, right? Mm -hmm. Where you're where you're you're tightly sealed in a vacuum bag, yeah. right? And then you die because um, you need air to live. 
right? And you, but, but it's not good for you to be alone. Mm-hmm. Um, and so God puts people around you, right. not necessarily people who are uh, completely well, in agreement. Going with back you. to Habakkuk, the Babylonian, he comes to fish. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you, you might sit him? down next to him and talk to him. Yeah, and he might say, maybe you know, maybe, maybe I don't need to destroy you. <laughs> right. <laughs> no. Um, so that's kind of personal, but but mm-hmm. also you know, well maybe the Babylonian needs to know of Christ. That's why I love you know we talked at the beginning of this uh, essay was uh, with the Magi, right? Yeah, that's one of my favorite stories for that reason. It's like these are these are Babylonian astrologers, yeah, yeah. right? And, yeah. and and Christ draws them to Himself right. through a star, mm-hmm. whatever astrological yeah. signs, yeah, and and a crazy book that Daniel left behind, some writings Daniel right. left behind, right? Yeah, or you know, it's like. It's it's just well, for centuries, they were for watching cent- for centuries. It's brilliant. It's brilliant. And as soon as they saw it, they were like, "We got to go." Right. It's but but that I mean that you can imagine the cultural commentary. People are like, "Well, no, they didn't go through the catechesis, and right. they don't really know the Bible, and they don't really they don't get to sit at the feet of Jesus." Well, right. Like, um, yeah, no, they do. Right. It's it'd be interesting to know the rest of their story. I'm sure there's there's probably mythology attached. Oh, I'm to them, sure or legend but anyway. Again, there is Jesus coming, coming outside the law, standing outside the pen, saying, "No, nah, let's open the gates, let them all yeah. out." Isn't that incredible? Right. And so that my point is that like cultural critique can provide mm. you opportunity, um, right? Not not to be just like the constant negative Nelly, although you can no. be. That's pretty easy to be. Well, that's cynical. the cynicism thing you talked about. Yeah. But on the other hand, you can say, no, I can actually interact with these people because I've thought about mm-hmm. it. And I actually, mm-hmm. maybe my pastor has actually helped me a little bit to understand right. what does the Bible have to say about this? Right. right. Well, I think mm-hmm. you and I are interested in people's presuppositions. Mm-hmm. Why yeah. do people think and say and behave the way they do? And the Bible has a lot to say about that. Right. You know, every but thought also, of his heart is evil all the days of his life. But that also this, this study of philosophy and history yeah. brings in, well, you know, people are complicated mm-hmm. beings and they, they don't often know where... Their ideas come from. Right. I mean, I don't know where all my ideas come from. I don't no. even know where I learn certain expressions. Right. Right. All right. Well, that's uh, another uh, again. There's the tabula rasa argument from the Enlightenment that we're all born blank slates, and then it just gets written on by. Mm. The, and if you want to know, know how that that bore fruit in the present tense, um, just because you say I'm a girl doesn't mean that I was born a girl. That's your cultural conditioning that's saying that. Right. Oh, well, we have to do government this way. Well, that's only because, you, uh, or to the point. The only reason you're a Christian is because you were born in America. If you were born in India, you'd be Hindu. That's the new atheist argument. That's the Richard Dawkins argument. The only reason Christians are Christians is because they're born in Christian countries. Which, mm. uh, you know, upon examination, that thing falls apart real quick, like pie crust. Because you know how many Christians are in India. But... India, exactly. Yeah. And yet, yeah, the whole point is to look at the culture around us and say, okay, it's evil, it's depraved. Now, how do I preach to that? How do I how do I live in my Christian vocation, and yet, like you pointed out, I got to work with pagans. You know, I read the imprecatory psalm this morning, and I actually prayed for the death of the people I work with. Mm. They're pagans; they're enemies of Christ. Mm-hmm. But I still got to work. Still got to pay it, bills. Do you know the etymology of that word, paganos? <laughs> what do you mean? Wow. Uh, so, so it. It's, I do, but what, what do you it's mean? It's just farmer. <laughs> it's a rural type. Really. Yeah. So this, because so I didn't know that. Yeah. So this is very interesting. I learned this from um, editing oh, yeah. a video. Editing Villager, a... rustic. Right. Exactly. It's, it's yeah. It comes from the Latin paganus. <laughs> yeah, so, okay, nice. so the pagans are the villager. Like, you know the yeah. yeah the villagers. They're so so you already have that sense in Greek like the high philosophy is for high culture is for the right, city dwellers. Not the pagans. Yeah. Not the pagans. Not for those guys out in the that's country. That's fantastic. Isn't that beautiful? That's great. Right, so that's what we're dealing with. It's like we're dealing with pagan. No, we're just dealing with all the, with the real. Well, people. you and I are in particular because we are we yeah we villagers are with the our pagans. people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And by the way, you know, to the we've talked about this before. You know, who's coming to church on Sunday? Pagans. Why? Because you're a sinner. Right. And so, how do I address pagans come Sunday if I'm just locked into this monastic lifestyle and I refuse to engage? Because even the monastics were engaged with the world. They made beer and sold it. They fished and then they sold the fish. Mm-hmm. They worked in the woods. They worked in their gardens. They were a part of the community. I think, they... I think I think the change, mm-hmm. um, or the dynamic that's harder for us, and we've been working on this, you know, on every podcast we've ever had, yeah. uh, is, is popular media, mm-hmm. which is quite a bit different than the, yeah. the, some of these other cultural things. Mm-hmm. Like just uh, 
the pervasiveness of it, the, yeah. the, the rapidity of it, how fast it can spread. Yeah. Um, and then also, you know, just how easily you have access to, to like the most base, <laughs> you know, cultural aspects. Yeah. Right. I mean, like you can, you can walk, um, virtually anyway, you can walk into a brothel like yeah. on your smartphone when you're, yeah. when you're six or something. Right. Yeah. Anywhere you want. And which would change your life forever mm -hmm. in a way that just physically wouldn't have been possible. Right. Right. And so, mm -hmm. um, so I think, you know, the cultural critique becomes even more relevant because of that. 100%. If you, you know, to your point then, right, is that like when Luther went to Rome for the first time and he expected to see the he had Holy heard City, rumors. Yeah, he had heard rumors, but he's like, no, this is going to be like Dante's Paradiso. I'm going to see like crystal cathedrals and the streets are going to be paved with gold and all the homeless people will be fat. And then he gets there, he's like, oh, dear God, this is like, this is worse than anything I could have imagined. And he yeah, gets makes, back. He makes so Wittenberg look like paradise. Home. Yeah, yeah. And and from the little then on, pig, the little pig farm town is yep. is paradise relative to compared to Rome. And in those yeah. days, you could get away with that. Versus now, we know that Hollywood's just a bunch of godless, psychopathic narcissists. And what do you like? We talked about. Are you going to stop watching TV and movies and engaging in social media altogether because you're flooded daily? With, well, some have. I mean, look yeah. at look at uh, Netflix, Amazon. Mm -hmm. They're all reporting significant mm -hmm. viewer right. losses. Right. And those aren't just Christians. Those are just moral people. <laughs> that are just like so fatigued with the message. You yeah, know? the message. And that's what I mean, though, is that to your point is that we can't, which is why, by the way, I think there's such a huge push towards transhumanism and escaping our bodies, much to fulfill the enlightenment idea the ideal of the enlightenment and the ideal of Platonism in general to get rid of this fleshy sack of worms and to escape. a higher form of being. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And so if we don't critique the culture, if we don't engage the culture and like with this text point out, Hey, here's the roots of this. We're, we're eating the fruit. Then you come to me as a Christian and you are seeking comfort in God's word about the death of your beloved. And there's a corpse right there at the front of the church. Mm -hmm. What do we do with the corpse? Well, he's not really here anymore. He's up in, in heaven fishing, <clears> looking <throat> down upon us. Mm, according to scripture, he's dead and he's asleep and he's awaiting the resurrection to eternal life. Because Jesus keeps saying, no, she's not dead. She's asleep. He's not dead. He's asleep. He stinks. Nah, he's asleep. Which is why when he raises people from the dead, he usually tells people, hey, give them something to eat. They're hungry. First <laughs> thing he does when he rises from the dead, I'm hungry. Give me something to eat. Versus in the present tense, because we've bought into the platonic lie. <laughs> His blood sugar like, was so low, he needed yeah, a honeycomb. Exactly. He needed honeycomb. <laughs> yeah, and if you know what happens to the human body when it dies, yeah, you are literally empty stomached when you wake up. Of course you're going to be starving. Yeah, right. But the point is, as a pastor, as a preacher, my responsibility with my vocation is not to lie to you and to repeat cultural idioms that make you feel good, but are not good. Yeah. My, my job is to preach the truth whether it makes you feel good or not. Hmm. Which again hmm. is why so many people quit going to church during COVID. There's many things I could say, but I'll mm -hmm. avoid it. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. The mechanism of salvation. Right. And so, yeah, God's going to kill you one way or the other. He's either going to do it to eternal life or to eternal death. It's, it's not a choose your own adventure, but... It uh... really isn't, which again is another <laughs> enlightenment ideal. <laughs> choose your own adventure. No. Um, and yeah, I mean, that's why stoicism is so popular again, because it really is all about the self, self-discipline, self-correction, self-knowledge, uh, self-responsibility. Yeah, but memento mori too. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. They're, they're closer to the kingdom than the postmoderns are. But it's still the same thing of we, if we don't engage with these, with these conversations, these voices, in my opinion, um, you're going to be swallowed up by them. Because the storm is upon us, and I'm with Luther. I think that God has taken his word away from us and left a remnant. I made that argument uh, to the brother pastors this week. Did mm -hmm. not did, did not get a lot well? of agreement. <laughs> did not get a lot of agreement. They're like, no. oh, no, the spirit ended the party. I'm like, look, if you're talking about being able to get, like, one kid in confirmation, mm -hmm. and you used to get 10. Yeah. Yeah. Like, you can't, are well, you going to blame yourself? I mean, I right. guess you could. But right. how about you just say the spirit is the guild doesn't bring... allow for it. Plus, our catechism teaches us it's the spirit that does it. So that we can't. Well, it... the Holy Spirit we... through the gospel calls, gathers, and the light. That's why I talked about lamenting. Like, can yeah. we actually blame the spirit? Can yeah. we say, God, you've 
you're withholding what, what your word What does God say us? to Ezekiel about the dry bones? Preach to the, preach to the wind. And mm-hmm. Ezekiel's like, are you out of your mind? <laughs> like, you want me to preach to you and command you to give life to these dead bones? Yeah, mm-hmm. go ahead. Yeah. I want to show you what I do. Right. Well, that's the important thing with all those lament psalms that I realized. It's, it's often mm-hmm. very, very brief, but yeah. there's always a... Um, but basically, it kind of ends, God, you take care of it. Right. right? Some, some kind of intercession yeah. to say, okay, mm-hmm. now, now resolve it. But right. I am going to complain a lot. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And we're not, we're, not, we're not complaining. We're just right. like, oh, it's just the culture. I'm like, yeah, we just mm-hmm. shrug. Yeah. Maybe it's, well, we're forsaking the word. That is the zeitgeist, though, when you say things like, well, it's just the way it is. Yeah, that's the zeitgeist. That's the herd mentality. Yeah. Oh, I can't help it. Oh. Yeah. So, anyways, things have changed. Yeah. <laughs> Let us know. Uh, thank you to fifteen seventeen for giving us a platform to have this conversation. Thank you to you for listening and and engaging with the conversation. And otherwise, we'll come back uh, with some new episodes, probably on Haman's actual text. Now that we've blasted through uh, the introduction, a lot of introduction. Yep. A lot of introduction. But once we get into the writings, I think you'll understand why we had to spend two hours on the introduction and going down a different set of rabbit trails that we. Uh, usually go down actually so anyways thank you as always for all your support thank you for your encouragement thanks for everybody on the live stream thanks for everybody who listens and downloads subscribe recommend it email 1517.org slash donate sounds good good and let them know you love the show and the whole reason that you're giving uh, 1517 your money is because you like the product that we put out and there are all the other products on 1517 buy my books buy Gillespie's coffee I think that's it any other product placements yeah, if you're still here with us, you probably your sanity is probably broken anyway. So, mm-hmm. check into a rehabilitation center for those recovering from uh, theological exhaustion. Otherwise, yeah, we'll go. talk to you again uh, real soon for a brand new episode. Peace. There we go. Made it. We did it. it has been Definitely. has it been? It's been over two weeks since we. Yeah, it's been over two recorded. Weeks. I noticed even because um, I took that week off with my face and my chest that even last week coming back and doing the Warrior Priest podcast. I was just out of sync with myself. Yeah, but the holiday does that too. It re- I said that to Annie this year more than previous years. Because um, last year, like I said, we had a blizzard the day before the Easter oh, last that's year. Oh, right. yeah, that's so right. So it was lowly attended anyway, so it was a nice cover because people didn't want to come to church last year because they were still freaked out about COVID. And this year, like I said, we had overflow this year. Like it was packed this year. Um, and it was a different that's vibe. Um, yeah, and that's emotionally, you know, Spiritually mm-hmm. draining. Yeah. 100%. And like I said, you and I both had a lot of flea bites during Lent this year. Not not outright attacks from Satan, just a lot of flea bites. And Well, physically too. Yeah, oh, yeah, sickness. big time. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, once Easter was over and I just made, I made it through Sunday with that chest cold and my nose being black and blue. I wasn't sure then, I was going to make it to Easter. And, yeah. Because mine, mine was, mine my, was my a elder, few days earlier. My yeah. elder who had to preach for me on Christmas Eve when I was in the hospital. He was, I was like, hey, Doug, I think, mm-hmm. I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna do a bookends this year. He's like, no, you're not. Do not make me preach on Easter for you. I'm like, it's a good sermon. It's a good sermon. It's all in King James English. <laughs> He's like, no. <clears throat> but um, yeah, so last week, we, everybody, because we all got that cold at different times. So last week, everybody was yeah. either sick or recovering. And then everybody at the gym got sick with the chest cold. So that was another wrinkle. It's been pretty serious because it hangs on too. It does. Yeah, I still have this. But I know people on. like two people in our family had it for two days. One of my uh, jujitsu students had it for two days. A couple of people at the gym had it for two days. My coach has had it for three weeks. I had it for three weeks. And so it's weird how it is affecting different people. Yeah. But, yeah, and I think too, you know, thanks, Teresa. I appreciate the comment. I think too, I because I said this on the Warrior Priest the other day too, is the conversation that I'm having on Warrior Priest and the texts that I'm reading and engaging with are not culturally acceptable anymore. They're not popular because I'm reading old world myths. I'm reading about generals and soldiers and philosophers like Nietzsche and reading the Stoics. And these aren't popular anymore. And, and therefore, the conversation is going to be limited. The, the, the number of people that want to come in and join that conversation is going to be limited. And also because of the addiction that we suffer to authority in our culture. That if I'm not a jock or I'm not a Joe Rogue and I'm not an authoritative figure, people are like, well, why would I listen to you even though you're saying the exact same thing that this other guy with 4 million listeners is saying? It's like, but he's special and you're not. It's like, so you're not really listening to the content, you're listening to the person. 
and you get this whole cult of personality that comes with the conversation. Yeah. Well, I mean, I would argue there's too many there's too many podcasts. Oh yeah. Yeah. But I but but I would argue that that's actually a good thing too. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right? Because it's I, very I democratic do, now. Exactly. I do yeah. not want a gated institutional narrative. Right. And especially when it comes to God's word. Hundred percent. Exactly. You know, I like I listen to podcasts that are people all over the spectrum. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah not yeah. and mostly not Lutheran. Yeah. Um, and I do that intentionally because it's like I I don't want to I don't want to get caught in a yeah in that's that, why I read in the that message. gated well right I don't want to get caught in that gated thinking yeah. of like saying right. here's what you're allowed to see here's what you're not allowed to right. say right I mean I have I have restraints because I have the confessions right right which I exactly. sworn to uphold etc yep so so I but that to that lack of freedom mm-hmm. to to think you know uh, and to question um, right to think because if you're not allowed to think wrong thoughts. You yeah. can't ever defend the truth because you never you never played right. the other side, right? Well, you don't know where the boundaries are. That's true too. That's yeah. why heresy is heresy is that you never actually went to the line and went, "I'm going to step over the line," and you're like, "Oh, the, no, yeah, no, Jesus over yeah. here." And this is why I think that the Bureau of uh, Disinformation yes. Services or whatever it's called. Yeah. I mean, I mean, it's it's so absurd, obviously, because it's taken from Harry Potter, but yeah. Um, but not even because of that necessarily, because mm-hmm. you're not going to convince people to firmly hold to orthodoxy if you don't allow them to question it. Remember what happened when de Blasio told people to call the hotline to report on their neighbors? Mm-hmm. Right. Remember what happened? And how they had to shut the shut them down within like a month because they got mm-hmm. so many people calling in and just slamming them? I mean, there's no... There, there's no I don't think there's any example of a Stasi style, you know, <laughs> no. policing state that actually has been, you know, successful no. over the long term. No. Right? They haven't survived. The cultural and there's consequences for that. are right, like we read with, with the Vendor Well, collapses stuff. society cuz yeah. cuz you can't trust anybody. <laughs> exactly. I like I said, you know, uh, an older uh, friend of mine retired now, but he was a missionary in Kazakhstan mm. in the early 2000s. And even in the early 2000s, a generation after the wall came down, People still wouldn't go to church because they were still angry at other people in church for spying on them in the well, 80s. Fair enough. But you can't replace that kind of social cultural trust when you've literally informed on your neighbors and it's led to them being interrogated and jailed. Yeah. Well, I mean, that that's, uh, I mean, how long and did it take to get over Donatism, right? We are right? on the cusp of that now, now with these types of th- situations. Like I saw um, in San Diego, there's a hotline you can call now in San Diego to report people for not wearing the masks in public or being where they're not supposed to be and doing what they're not supposed to do. And yeah, I'm looking at like, I'm looking at this article on Donatism and mm-hmm. related to COVID. So it's yeah. kind of a fun kind of parallel. And it it took I mean granted things don't move quite as quickly. Um yeah. but it took more than a hundred years for people to trust the church again. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know? And it well, took edicts. And maybe and, that's where we're at is just the beginning of that exodus out of the kind of institutionalized, ghettoized conversation I was talking about with friends of mine who are devout Christians who don't go to church. Yeah. And that it's going to be their children and their children's children that eventually, you know, after the fourth generation that make their way, because they're going to be the ones who come out. It's like I talk about that it was the Gen Xers who brought back um, celebrating the sacrament every week and the chalice. That was yeah. us. We brought that back. And a lot of liturgical renewal stuff. A lot of like, liturgical renewal came but, out of But that. from a dogmatic perspective, not necessarily right. just from a, it makes us feel better. Yeah. And now we see our children growing up with reverence and respect for the chalice, for example. Mm-hmm. And people that come to my church that grew up in non-denominational congregations, at first they're like, what are you doing? But now they're my, they are the most diehard about the sacrament, both baptism yeah. and the Lord's Supper. Yeah, yeah. Because once they've been catechized, they're like, oh... I've missed this my entire life. And you know what they're missing? An objective certainty. I was going to say reality. Objective yeah, objective reality. reality. They're missing that objective certainty. Like, I come for the preaching, and I love your preaching. However, <laughs> when I come to communion, and it's the same thing every Sunday, I love that so much. And I'm like, oh, so you crave consistency. You crave mm-hmm. knowing, hey, when I come to church Sunday, pastor is going to throw something at me that may provoke me, may engage me, may not. But that sacrament, man... This is this is a really interesting thought. But could you trust God if you weren't consistently answering his, your prayers? No. Delivering his promises? No. Hmm. This is the argument in Job. Yeah. Right? The hidden God, arbitrary, capricious, he's Odin. 
I so if there were a Sunday you came to church and he didn't forgive your sins that Sunday, that That's might it. break it's your done. Yeah, that might right. break your trust in him, or at least right. in that <laughs> that manifestation of uh, institutional church. What is it that drives a child to hide from his parent when he does something wrong? It's the fear of the opposite happening. I know my, my dad wants. loves me. I know my dad sacrifices. I see it all the time. He hugs me. He gives me kisses. He does stuff with me. We have fun together. But when I do something wrong, he's gonna, he's going to turn and he's going to be the opposite. And he's going to be cruel and malevolent. What do, what do you do to a dog once it bites you? Exactly. Well, what I do, or what are you supposed to do? <laughs> yeah, I had that con- I had that confrontation with my dog last night, but um, yeah, it worked itself out just fine. Um, but yeah, that's the problem is that if God is like that, where it's like, well, I know He loves me and forgives me, but if I do this, this might be the time He mauls me. Yeah, exactly. And that's why the the story of the bear running out of the woods and mauling the children. <laughs> oh, with uh, which prophet? Is that Elisha? Is that Elisha? I think it's the, Elisha. Where, bald, where they call him bald head. Him. Hey, yeah, bald, bald head. head. You bald head. And so the bears rush out and kill him, and you're like... She so, bears, too. They're mama yeah, bears. Yeah, you're like, that's a little bit extreme. Why don't we teach that in Sunday school? It's like, mm, well, who, yeah, you know. Don't um, want God's prophet. Not a good plan. But also that's, you know, something, again, that I've recovered from going back through my Paulson lectures and, and going back through his sermons is, he never for a second presents Jesus as a nice person. The We're sweet, safe, really. Oh, that's what I mean, though, is that he is both awful and joyful simultaneously, which is proven mm. throughout the Gospels. He's There's like glad real. Yeah, I mean, there are lots of people who think that Jesus is awful, starting with the Pharisees. Mm-hmm. But there's just lots of people that leave him because he's like, I'm going to go die now. And they're like, so no more free lunches? I, I, think, the, I, I think the most remarkable thing is when he's teaching in Capernaum after he f- feeds the 5,000, right? Right. And they just like, and many yeah. people left him that day. <laughs> and many people left. I was like, why? Because what he said was awful. You must and, eat my flesh and drink my blood or you have no life in you. Right. Again, like I said, there was no joy in uh, Mudville that day that Casey struck out. <laughs> and uh, what's that story about? That poem, but mm-hmm. um, the mighty Casey at bat. So I think that's the problem is that when we preach and teach, we don't present God as being both awful and joyful, even though you just read the Psalms of Lament, as you pointed out. God's awful. Habakkuk straight up says to God, you're an awful God. In fact, apparently you promote evil. And God's like, um, first of all, I'm God and I'm good. And second of all, uh, you're evil. So calling me evil when you are functionally evil, pot, kettle, black, eh, same thing with Jesus and the Beelzebub thing. Yeah. Like he's, he's possessed by Satan. Really? Are we yeah. going to go there? It's like when somebody accuses another of being a threat to democracy. Yeah. You know who's actually the threat? Is, oh, <laughs> Russian collusion. Now we the know. one. Yeah. That judge Who, struck that down. Did you see that? Yeah. I wonder. Durham's oh. like, yeah, I want to I include this in the evidence. And the judge is like, no, no, you're not. And then, of course, we know who appointed that judge to the bench. Mm-hmm. And that's the way it's become now. Again, going back to, I read that to my kids, and my kids immediately knew it was about us. My kids are like, yeah. that sounds exactly like what's happening now. I'm like, hmm, yeah, because mm-hmm. we're super unoriginal in how we sin against God. Mm-hmm. You know, And so we know there's no justice anymore. And there never was any to, to begin with, but we didn't have the internet. But now we know there's no justice in the land. So we know, depending on the judge and who appointed that judge, this is how this court case is going to come out, right? The judge in the Ghislaine Maxwell case, yeah. who was she yeah. appointed by? And then yeah. what happened to her after that case? She got promoted. She got a better deal. She got a better judgeship. That was her uh, reward. And everyone's like, I'm shocked. I'm like, I'm not. How, how are you shocked by this? This is how this works. Right. You right. Know? How do people get famous in Hollywood? Not from talent. <laughs> Megan Fox just proved that on the internet the other day. <laughs> I mean, I only drink a little. I mean, he slashes his chest open and I suck blood out of well, his sometimes, chest. Well, sometimes. It's just sometimes. It's just, it's just, sometimes Usually it's just a few drops. Usually it's yeah, just a few drops. He just cuts his finger. It's a blood but, oath. And the, yeah, I mean, you know. Yeah. It's not, the no. middle finger on the left hand that all these politicians and celebrities seem to constantly not pagan have band aids on. Not pagan at all. Um, these villagers. <laughs> Now you've ruined that word for me forever. Isn't that fun? I'm going to think of that every time. Oh, the villages are coming. I'm editing, uh, this is one of the projects I had to work on, but uh, editing this video, uh, Anthony Esselin, who, you know, who's, mm-hmm. uh, uh, you know, knows ancient stuff, 
Okay. Well, mostly old English, but um, nice. Knows Greek and others. Yeah. So he he's talking about, you know, the first video I edited is basically, um, no, we have actually it's to this topic. Um, it's you have we have permission to diagnose the culture and to call the thing what it is. That's his right. argument. And he gives lots of examples. You know, look, we our literacy compared to late 19th century in the U.S. You know, it's abysmal. Yeah. Yeah, we're we're not well read. We can't read. Mm -hmm. You know, and here's an example. And he just goes right. through and he says, like, I can do the diagnosis because here it is. Just right. look at look at what people were reading. You know, three hundred thousand. Mm -hmm. You know, a circulation of three hundred thousand in the U.S. Yeah. with a population yeah. a third of what it is now. Yeah, and look at what they were reading. They were reading yeah. theology. They were reading poetry. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, well, it was the considered readers... a virtue to have a large vocabulary <sighs> among farmers. When you, when you well, I was going to say. Um, when you watch really well-written Westerns, they get that. A bad Western doesn't understand that. But in the Old West, amongst uneducated, illiterate people, to have a large vocabulary was considered a sign of learning, education, but virtue. You were a good man or woman yeah. if you had a big vocabulary. Yeah. And so you see these people in the Old West using words that they obviously have no idea what they mean, but they're using them because they've heard them used on, on the stage or they've heard a public reading and they're like, oh, that's a good word. That's a three-syllable word. I'm going to use that from now on. And, you know, this is what fascinates me about this, this deep dive that I've been doing lately on history is we had all of these, we had an explosion of innovation in the late 1800s into the early 1900s and then flatlined. It just flatlined. And then you don't get, like, Tesla was not an exception to the rule. That's what after is, the fact. You have to ask what happened yeah, leading exactly. up to like, World War I. What happened to society what, after those, World War One? Those like, well, uh, leading up to it even, you know, 20, 25 years, yeah. what was going on? Yeah. You know, I mean, obviously there were major economic shifts that were happening. Yeah. And, hmm. But just across the board, in education, in medicine, in the sciences in general, in learning, everything. Just culturally, environmentally, mm -hmm. all sorts yeah. of stuff. Yeah. yeah. Just right off the edge. And now we have inventors but we don't have an explosion of inventions and patents and all this stuff. It's, yeah, it's, it's, it's Where's the flying cars? Although I did, I did see you um, self-lacing shoes is a thing. I didn't know that, mm -hmm. that Nike was actually making those now. There you go. So we got That'll that. We don't have flying better, cars, <laughs> Really? They're $300. No, of course they're not. That's what I'm saying. We'll just we, lace your we, shoes, man. We are a culture of tchotchkes, knickknacks, mm. widgets, gizmos. I've, I have a house full of widgets and knickknacks. You know, but as far as like inventing Roman cement, that's not us. Yeah. Well, um, again, it's like you look at buildings, for example. My kids notice this, and this is my kids of all things. Uh, and I didn't okay. prom. They're watching the 1800s. They're watching like Kiev actually in the 1800s came up. Minsk came up uh, and other places around the world. And you're looking at the architecture and you look, and then my kids are like, why is everything so ugly now? And why don't we build stuff like that anymore? I'm like, because your kids even understand inherently that's artistic. I'm like, that's right. a thing. Again, you go back to Plato and the essence of beauty and blah, blah, blah. But like, your kids look at something and go, that took a lot of work. And that's amazing. Yeah. And then or you could use, you could use furniture as a diagnosis sure, too. And oh, yeah. I mean, old furniture. Oh. You can so, get it on the cheap at the antique store. Yeah. But, yeah. right. Right. Well, I don't buy they, anything nice because my kids just destroy everything. Destroy it, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, so I figure everything is disposable, hundred percent. But yeah, my kids recognize that skyscrapers are like, yeah, that's amazing, but it's not art. No, and how much is it going to cost to tear it down when nobody wants to be in it? Like the mm -hmm. malls, what do mm -hmm. we do to the malls? Just let them rot. Yeah, they're like the old barn yeah. that just whole YouTube rots. videos around them. Yeah, oh man, I saw another barn that had collapsed in the storm the other day. It just made me sad. I get it. Well, you're not using it anymore. I get exactly. that. Exactly. Yeah, I know. It's just, it just, it's the, it's the skeletal remains of a past society yeah. that doesn't Place exist anymore. Place and a people and mm -hmm. yeah, everything, culture. Yeah. And so I think with every, with the decline of civilization, that's what you see. You see the decline of civilization, it gets buried, literally in some cases, and then it's lost and we forget about it. And then somebody digs it up and goes, huh, how'd they do that? Whereas with ours, I don't think they're going to have that problem. How'd they do that? <laughs> I think it'd be pretty easy to explain. Well, I mean, we have whole eras that we call things like dark ages. Yeah. Well, I think my, we might be we might be in one. Oh, but they had the internet. Yeah. And then you look at functional illiteracy. Right. Yeah. So, hmm. I don't know. I got Jesus. It's like I, I said that to the, a friend of mine at the gym the other night. I was leaving the changing room. We were talking. I'm like, listen, man, if I wasn't a Christian, 
I would be a fatalist. I would just despair right now because he is. And so I was just point blank. I'm like, listen, man, I'm a Christian and I have hope and I have faith in the future, um, which is why I can talk about this stuff without, you know, being like you, just a fatalist. Um, whereas he has nothing. He has nothing higher than himself to, to look forward to. He has no hope in the future. It's closed to him. Yeah. And, and he has no foundation to build off of for the future either. And it's like, he's in his late twenties. And it's like, you got a lot of life left to live, man. W- what do you build on for your foundation then? Other than to just, well, I guess I'll just do what everybody else is doing. It's easily understandable. I totally get oh, it. Oh, easily. Yeah, 100%. I don't, I don't judge people anymore because I'm old enough now and have gone through it myself enough that I'm like, no, that's, that's totally normal. I mean, you I'm, can see all sorts of diagno- I'm diagnostic, yeah. you know, or, or what mm-hmm. do you want to say, indicators. I mean, yeah. like, like childlessness is an example of that. Right. People don't have children when they, when they have no hope. Mm-hmm. Well, and, and look at, you know. Because why? I mean, why? The population have, rate is, the birth rate has dropped by 50%. In the United States, over well, I can't remember the, the time frame, but um, yeah, we're not having too many babies. They keep saying things like that. And it's like we're n- we're actually we're going the other way rapidly, right? Which well, you know, but yeah, I mean, but if you don't, if you imagine like life is going to be miserable, why would you exactly? Do it? Why exactly? Yeah, no, I have a friend. He's like, if you could have another baby right now, would you? And I, my gut, I literally said without thinking, no, absolutely not. And then we talked, and I, and I go, you know what? I want to repent of that. Actually, I would. And he's like, why? I'm like, because I have faith. Because it's narrow thinking. You're just yeah. thinking. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, and what's, what, what's that? Uh, it's not, I don't think it's legit, but they ascribed to Luther, right, about planting a tree if he knew the mm-hmm. world was going to Yeah, yeah, the apple tree, yeah. Yeah, whatever. Technically, the right he studies, actually, what he actually said was he'd be having sex with Katie. That's the actual quote. Oh, that's better. Is that, you know, if you knew that Jesus was coming back today or the world was going to end, what would you do? He's like, you'd find me in bed with my beloved bride, Katie. Oh, that's, that's nice. That's the original quote. Yeah, because that's what you should be doing when Jesus comes back is be with your helpmate. Right. Help yeah. him. <laughs> right. Help. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> Let me help you. <laughs> let me help you. Jesus is coming mm. back. So, you know, one last, one last run around the block and uh, then we'll call it a day. <laughs> but um, because what else are you going to do? Yeah. Like you said, what are you going to do? Just anesthetize yourself and sell the well, song? You well, you could. Yeah. I mean, you know. That's a great a, song, by the way. We're less than 5% of the population, but we take more than 45% of the world's pharmaceuticals. Something. Something. Tells you everything you need to know Jeez. about our culture. Yeah. We can't it's be the only ones that the see this. The statistics coming no. out now after the fact that the United States has been one of the sickest countries in the last two and a half years, even though we've had some of the most stringent uh, mandates and, and rules and guidelines and, and cultural push. What's well, like that meme of the beach, you know, 1970, yeah, the, 2021. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> like, oh, I see how it looked. Oh, Create the disease, good. sell the cure, you know. And that's the problem with the church. The problem with, the, with when God sends a preacher, not churches in general, but when God sends a preacher, he actually says, I got the cure for your disease, but it's final, which means... Every week when you come back for your prescription, I'm going to give you the exact same pill. Mm-hmm. You don't ever have to worry about anything else. I got this taken care of. Yeah, but and like we talked about earlier, it's going to be you're going to die because I have to separate you out from sin, death, and hell, and this is the only way to do it. Yeah, I mean, you could say it a number of different ways. Do you need to be healed repeatedly, converted yeah. again? Yes. Sure. Um, do you believe it, or do you keep doubting? Yes. Of course. <laughs> Which is why yeah. you keep coming back. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Yeah, when, once I started saying that to my people, the whole reason, you know, do you, do you know why we confess every Sunday? Because I keep preaching to you that your sin is forgiven today and always, and therefore you don't have to confess your sin. And they're like, yeah, why do we have to do that? I'm like, because you don't believe it. <laughs> they're like, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, and we're not excluded from that anyway, too. No, of course not. <laughs> That's well, why I have to keep saying it. Say, you don't have to come to the sacrament every Sunday if you don't want to, but I need it every Sunday. <laughs> You know, and, and this is one of the one of the most awesome things about the gym is my gym, not the other gym, but is that the members of my church who are also members of my gym, if they can't be in church on Sunday, they'll ask me before classes, "Hey, after classes, can we go upstairs and, and receive the sacrament from you?" I'm like, yeah. "Of course you can." And then yeah. other people hear that. What, like, what, hey, is, can we what does the too? confession say? Yeah, and whenever it's it's desired. <laughs> exactly. And I'm yeah. like, it's an honor that I can you know sit downstairs and do this, and then we can go upstairs afterwards, and as a congregation. Because there's 12 of us. Right. I can administer this to you. It's fantastic. Oh, but we're smelly. Yeah, exactly. So am I. <laughs> perfect. We're perfect. It's like I keep, I've been hammering on this uh, since uh, in Lent now. Like, do you know where God goes to get preachers? Go ahead. Guess. 
I'm like, he goes to the dump. Because those are the, that's the only place he can find preachers that are worthy of his calling. That's why your yeah. preacher is a piece of garbage and a scumbag. Not by God's standards, but by the world standards. And sometimes so they are actual so, scumbags. <laughs> so so, you're, so your, your post role is actually kind of nice because you're all kind of smelly. Exactly. We're smelly. We're tired. We've beaten each other up. And now we're like, well, that didn't work to satisfy. Let's go to the table. And he's like, thank you. Finally. The law has done its work. That's now right. come and receive. It's revealed reality to you. Exactly. That's right. So, yeah, I think it's a beautiful thing. And, and unfortunately, the relationships that we develop in martial arts, combat martial arts, which is based on in, intimacy and trust and respect, unfortunately, that you don't have that in the culture today. You know, in that society, people don't understand the attraction, um, why people are so zealous about jujitsu and Muay Thai in that context, and then why they're also devoutly Christian. It's like, well, because one actually leads to the uh, other, naturally. Mm -hmm. Because, yeah, it's a lot of diminishing returns. Yeah. You know, time is Yeah, undefeated. well, and it would be different. I mean, I suppose it would be uh, analogous is if you had, like, say, 10 families, multi-generational in mm -hmm. your congregation, you would have that same degree of intimacy. They'd be intermarried, you yeah. know, kind of thing. Where, I mean, not every congregation is going to be like that. But um, that was, that created that same kind of intimate tribal, mm -hmm. you know, character. It where did. you live next to each other, mm -hmm. right? Your your kids married each other. Mm -hmm. You know, you didn't move away. It wasn't highly yeah. mobile, yeah. right? And and it pers and it persisted generation to generation. Right. And so you right. you're like, look, I have to. I'm gonna have to learn to trust this person because right. I'm. We're gonna be next door neighbor, and our kids are gonna grow up next to each other. And yeah. Know. Well, somebody yeah. asked me this again. They're like, so you know, my oldest is 19, and and the person said, so when is he leaving home? And I'm like, whenever he wants to. And they just looked at me like, what? Mm -hmm. I'm like, he can leave whenever he wants. Right. He's my son. Why would I want him to leave? I love him. Yeah. He loves me. Well, my son wants to come back. Yeah, exactly. He's been at college. Yeah, damn right. He wants like, to come back. I would want to come right. back right now too. Yeah. Yeah. So he's going to be back for the summer. So. And why not? Again, why not? Well, because you've been culturally conditioned to kick your child out of the house artificially. My 15-year-old daughter figured this out last year. She's yeah. like, dad, tell him, like, making us go to college and leave home when we're 18 is dumb. Who made that rule up? I'm like, well, actually, honey, it was in the 1950s. <laughs> you know? And she's like, if, yeah, that makes If fun. you wanted to take uh, children out of the purview of their parents and indoctrinate go. them. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, because what happens? If you don't, like to Chad's point, right, dealing with objective reality on the topic of family, well, we see what happened. We saw what happened when we allowed <laughs> the zeitgeist to I should, dictate I should, to us. I, I should have reposted that. Uh, it's a really short quote from uh, Thomas Sowell. On, uh, it was a video. Where yeah. uh, I forget, I think it was Charlie Rose asked him mm -hmm. in an interview, like, um, so, so what do you think about, uh, you know, family? And he's like, well, you heard, uh, you know, Bill and Hillary say that it takes a village to to raise a child, yeah, but it would take a village idiot to 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 believe that, right? That's like, true. No, that's true. Yeah. It's like, oh, I see, because it. Because, I mean, you want to talk about so uh, uh, cultural mm. Marxism? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How much more could you get? It? Right. Oh, but. But it, you need a support structure around you, do you? I mean, it's nice, it's helpful, mm -hmm. um, especially if you have family that you know are faithful right. can help. But if you have mm -hmm. friends, yeah, okay, fine. But a clan, I'm good with a clan. A clan. Anything beyond that, we're mm. right. But but what what did they mean? They meant a state mandated one. Yes, exactly. Oh, public schooling and with guidance counselors and right. oh, ah, you know that oh, village, I, the village of the damned. Village. Yeah. The, <laughs> The, the imposed village, <laughs> the, right. the, uh, the city planned. Yes, exactly. Hey, by yeah. the way, I recommend this to my Bible study group, so I'll recommend it to people on the live stream. If you want to watch a great theological study in death and life, watch The Trouble with Harry by Alfred Hitchcock. It's a dark comedy. It's hilarious if, you, if you're theologically you know, directed that way. It's The Trouble with Harry. Harry's a dead body on the lawn. And the entire movie centers around... Harry, and, right. and what to do about Harry, because without spoiling it, um, Harry moves. <laughs> right. He moves a lot more than the other characters, and he's dead. But it's a hilarious, hilarious movie, and, and basically Hitchcock's just pointing a finger, kind of poking at this culture where we kind of like, you know, we worship and obsess over death and disease. And uh, right. yeah, it's just fascinating. It's great. Yeah, which is millennia old. Yeah, it is. Just so yeah, the trouble with faces, faces and names change. And I just started watching um, 
oh, what's that name? Um, it's on Amazon. It stars uh, Josh Brolin. Um, Other Range, is that the name of it? Oh, I saw that pop up. Yeah, I'm enjoying it a lot. It's it's a contemporary Western slash metaphysical mystery. Oh, yeah, that's why it was interesting to me. Long I thought story the short, great. a rancher finds a black hole in the ground on his property. Beautiful. <laughs> and Are there Kanju? Been... I like Kanju. And it may have been carved by Kronos. Oh, even better. And yeah, it's it's so far, it's one of those, one, it's intelligently written. Like whoever wrote it really understands like farm life and ranch life. Like they nail it to a T, even the language and just the, the house. Mm. But it's the type of show that's so well written that I'm anxious at the end of every episode where I'm like, I got to watch the next episode because it keeps, it keeps creating more questions than answers. Yeah. And so it's annoying. It's, it's like Lost the first season. Right, where it was actually think, captivating. Yes, yeah. where you're like, oh, what's the, you know, what's in the hatch and what's the black smoke? And, and then it's like, here, we're renewed for another 24 episodes. Yeah, oh, and you're like, no. oh, you didn't have a plan. Uh, <laughs> but it's like that in the sense of like, it's it's based in contemporary reality. and So maybe it has a plan. Maybe that's the difference. Hopefully it does have a plan because it seems like the screenwriters are smart. The direction is smart. The acting is really well done. And they've planned out three or four seasons and figured so. it out. Well, it's Amazon, yeah. so I'm sure that they gave them a contract. It was like, we're giving you... Uh, we just finished uh, Slow Horses on uh, Apple TV. Oh, okay. It's, it's got... Um, it's MI5, except it's like... It's the mm. rejects that, that have oh, all... Oh, really? They're all broken. And then cool. the, the lead guy is... It's it's slow house. It's for the slow the slow horses, not for the dogs that run the uh, NMI five. It. Right? Yeah, yeah. Um, that's why they call it that. And it's like a, a long way from the outer yard. range. There we go. Outer range. Yeah. Um, but the lead guy is oh uh, Commissioner Gordon from the from the Black Knight trilogy, Dark Knight trilogy. Oh, J.K. Uh, Simmons. Oh no, that's no. that's J. J. Jonah Jameson. Um, uh, Gary. Yeah, Gary. What's his name? <laughs> Immortal Beloved, the Professional. Yeah, yeah, it'll come to me. He's he's the he's the head of the house. They're all broken, mm -hmm. uh, and they're you know trying to find like they're trying to like be useful, but they're not useful. And you, it's already renewed for a second season, so they no show kidding. it again. Uh, I enjoyed it quite a bit because it's it's really it's really slow at the beginning. Oldman, like, Gary Oldman, Gary Oldman. Jeez. Yeah, really slow at the beginning, like a you know like a a good British you know crime yeah, drama would be. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, and then it picks up. It does pick yeah. up as you as you really get to know the characters. It picks yeah. up. Yeah. So cool. The pacing's good. It's not super wokey. Mm -hmm. You know. Yet. It's British. They were super wokey in the early two thousand. I mean, the context is because you're dealing with a Muslim yeah. in in England. Yep. But. Yep. But that's I mean that's real. That's yeah. that's actually a true conflict that's happening that's between yeah. like actual white supremacists and Muslims yeah. and whatever. I, it may be a little overwrought, but. But the characters are interesting, and the story cool. is well told. So. Nice. I like it. Yeah, check it out. I will do that for sure. Slough right. House. Slough House. So it's time for tacos, I think. Yeah, it's time to end. Cool. Thanks, right. everybody. What <laughs> times? Jeez. We'll see if we can't work it out next week. You know. Sounds good. We'll clip off the first five <laughs> seconds of this live stream. Mm -hmm. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to temporarily uh, um, delist it until I can edit it. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> chop, chop. We don't want to get in trouble. There we go. <laughs> Yeah, in more trouble. Uh, so thanks, everybody. We will um, talk to you, uh, not well, maybe next week if Gillespie can figure out how to live stream from his car. But uh, <laughs> you, you can just talk at me. I'll, I'll feed you things here and there. I'll monologue and you can interject. I just have to upgrade my data plan. Although I don't want to monologue about Haman. Ugh. No, we can. Re no, it's just the Bible parts where he just, where he just does his Bible interpretation. Sounds good. I like it. Okay. All right. Bye. I'll talk to you. Peace.